Secretary Mayorkas. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Good morning. Today is a solemn occasion as this committee begins official impeachment proceedings in the matter of Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and his handling of America's borders since taking office in February 2021. I wish we weren't sitting here today. I wish these proceedings were not necessary. I wish our southwest border was secure. I wish that our government was enforcing the laws passed by the Congress and doing its job to keep the American people safe. Unfortunately, Secretary Mayorkas has done none of these things. For almost a year, the House Committee on Homeland Security has conducted a comprehensive investigation into the causes, costs, and consequences of the unprecedented crisis at our southwest border. Our evidence makes it clear. Secretary Mayorkas is the architect of the devastation that we have witnessed for nearly three years. The findings of our investigation, available to the public at homeland.house.gov, coupled with the Secretary's refusal to change course on the reckless decisions facilitating this crisis, have left us with no reasonable alternative than to pursue the possibility of impeachment. The Secretary's actions have brought us here today, not ours. Since early 2021, we've watched in disbelief as historic numbers of inadmissible aliens have poured across our borders, both at official ports of entry and illegally crossing the thousands of miles of our borders. On Secretary Mayorkas's watch, Customs and Border Protection has recorded more than 8.1 million encounters at America's borders, including more than 6.7 million at our southwest border alone. For comparison, CBP recorded just over 3 million encounters nationwide from fiscal year 2017 to 2020. Jay Johnson, President Obama's former DHS secretary, previously said that a thousand encounters a day, quote, overwhelms the system, end quote. On Secretary Mayorkas's watch, encounters have never averaged less than 3,000 per day, even going as high as 10 to 12,000. Per day. Just a few days ago, internal CBP numbers leaked to the media showed another 302,000 encounters at the southwest border alone in December. By far an all-time record. That's nearly enough people to fill the Rose Bowl three times in just one month. In addition to these catastrophic numbers of the record 1.8 million known gotaways who've entered the country on Secretary Americas's watch, individuals that Border Patrol agents no slip across our border, but are not apprehended in large part because the cartels overwhelm the agents with large groups of coyote, paid, and escorted migrants. The agents see them and they count them, but they cannot apprehend them. But the numbers are most certainly far worse. As agents are moved to crossing sites to process migrants and the border is completely unmanned, there are no agents present to count the known gotaways the number of unknown gotaways is no doubt enormous. Thousands of agents have been pulled off the front lines to process and release into our country record numbers of illegal aliens who know they will be released into the country and given a free bus or plane ticket to the city of their choice. I ask you to watch this video. A border shutdown in El Paso, Texas, as hundreds force their way onto the Paso del Norte International Bridge. Title 42 has officially expired. Homeland Security officials say illegal border crossings topped 10,000 per day this week, the highest levels ever. Thousands of migrants in central Mexico continue to travel on freight trains and travel all the way to the southern border arriving here in Eagle Pass. Outnumbered and out-resourced, Border Patrol agents say they are struggling to keep up with this massive influx of migrants descending on our southern border. Border Patrol clearly does not have the manpower to process the thousands of migrants here. So the situation is pretty dire. Hundreds upon hundreds of adult men who have crossed illegally waiting here in the Arizona sun for Border Patrol to apprehend them and uh, they hope be released into the United States somewhere. Sources telling News Nation that agents have been pulled from nearby checkpoints to assist in processing the thousands of migrants crossing into Eagle Pass every day. And this is all by design. The smugglers realize that this particular area is vulnerable. 
What Americans must understand today is that these historic numbers, the chaos you just saw on the screen, are the result of a much deeper problem. And that problem is not instability in other countries. It's not poverty. It's not climate change. It's not supposedly broken immigration system. All of these excuses have long predated Secretary Mayorkas' tenure, and yet we've never experienced a crisis like this. As even the New York Times admits, and I quote, push factors don't explain the entire surge, and maybe not even most of it. There have been no recent wars in Latin America, and the region's poverty rate has been flat, end quote, the New York Times. I'll also note that uh, two of the 16 cities in the world with the highest murder rates are right here in the United States. Now, this crisis has been intentional. Secretary Mayorkas was made aware of testimony given by President Biden's Attorney General Merrick Garland, where the AG admitted the current policies are being exploited by the cartels. Yet Secretary Mayorkas turns around and implements additional policies to expand the catch and release measures, empowering the cartels and killing Americans. After nearly three years of watching this unfold, what other conclusion is there but this is an intentional crisis? Secretary Mayorkas has brazenly refused to enforce the laws passed by Congress as an enacted policies that knowingly make our country less safe. What we're seeing here is a willful violation of his oath of office taken by Secretary Mayorkas. Let me repeat that, a willful violation. Secretary Mayorkas has used mass parole to release more than 1.5 million inadmissible aliens into the country, despite the Immigration and Nationality Act stating that parole is to be used only as an, I quote, case by case, end quote, and, quote, temporary basis for a, quote, significant benefit or urgent humanitarian reason, end quote. The chief patrol agent of the Border Patrol's Laredo sector told us last June that historically parole, and I quote, was used only in extreme humanitarian instances. If a child was sick, had to go to the hospital, we'd parole the parent in, a some, or, in or something like that. But that was very rare. It wasn't an everyday thing, end quote. This Porter chief is right. The scale of Secretary Mayorkas' mass use and abuse of parole is unprecedented and has been declared inconsistent with the laws passed by Congress by multiple federal judges, but remains a central component of Secretary's agenda. The Immigration and Nationality Act also requires that illegal aliens apprehended crossing the border be detained pending their removal proceedings. Secretary Mayorkas has ignored this law. In fiscal year 2013, according to DHS's own numbers, the Obama administration detained 82% of illegal aliens from the moment they were encountered until their case was decided, and another 9% were held for at least some, time, some portion of time after that. That's a pretty good track record and under a Democrat administration. In Secretary Mayorkas' first year on the job, that 82% number dropped to just 10%. Illegal aliens not detained at all jumped from 9% to 64% in FY21. In a court opinion earlier this year, federal judge Kent Weatherell wrote, and I quote, the evidence establishes that in late January or early February of 2021, DHS made a discreet change in detention policy from release only if there is a compelling reason to, to release unless there is a compelling reason not to, end quote. The deputy chief of the Border Patrol's Yuma sector told our committee in September, quote, the belief that they are going to be released with no consequences is certainly something that many migrants tell our agents, end quote. On Secretary Mayorkas' watch, that's a pretty good bet. And under his leadership, individuals guilty of violent crimes and even some of the on the terrorist watch list have been released into this country. Just Monday, multiple sources confirmed Secretary Mayorkas admitted that released rates of illegal aliens are currently around 85%. All told, DHS numbers indicate that well over 3 million inadmissible aliens have been released into our country on Secretary Mayorkas' watch. Factor in the 1.8 million known gotaways, the unqualifiable unknown gotaways, that's roughly the population of the state of South Carolina. Not only has Secretary Mayorkas refused to detain these individuals in accordance with the law, but he has also made it nearly impossible for Immigrations and Customs Enforcement to remove them. 
His policies have largely restricted the ability of ICE to detain and remove the population of illegal aliens. ICE removes ICE removals dropped from more than 267,000 in FY19 to less than 60,000 in FY21 and 70,000 in 22. The FY23 numbers were better, but were still more than 40,000 fewer than the lowest year of the last administration, which largely occurred in the midst of COVID, the COVID pandemic. Criminals as a percentage of all ICE arrests went from around 90% in FY 2020 to just 43% in FY 23. The secretary is not even living up to his own flawed standards that supposedly prioritize threats to public safety. The former sector chief in San Diego told us in May of 2023 that he didn't think the consequences of being removed from the country was being utilized enough to deter illegal immigration. Even Texas Democrat, Mr. Cuellar has said, and I quote, if you don't detain people, if you don't send people back, then the border becomes a speed bump, end quote. On top of all this, upon entering office, Secretary Maricus immediately began dismantling effective policies that had secured the southwest border, despite being warned by experienced border security personnel the consequences that would result. That, coupled with his consistent decision to double down on his own unlawful policies, indicates an intentionality to this crisis. And I must note with great emphasis, these are not simple policy differences. This is a years-long pattern of refusing to enforce the laws passed by Congress. Our investigation also uncovered the fact that Secretary Mayorkas has violated the authority of his office. Secretary Mayorkas has directed the department to create numerous new unlawful mass parole programs that have allowed an unprecedented number of individuals to enter our country who otherwise would have no lawful basis to be here and to incentivize migrants to make the dangerous and sometimes deadly travel to our southern border. He has also effectively told ICE officers not to do their job in enforcing America's immigration laws. According to his own guidance to ICE, and I quote, the fact an individual is removable should not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them, end quote. End quote, our personnel should not rely on the fact of conviction, end quote, for a flatly deportable crime, but must consider, quote, mitigating factors that mitigate, humiliate in favor of declining enforcement action, end quote. He has even overseen the reckless and irresponsible use of federal law enforcement personnel to sweep under the rug the mess he's made at the southwest border. Border Patrol agents from the northern border have been deployed to the southwest border to assist in processing and releasing illegal aliens into the interior. Hundreds of law enforcement professionals from Homeland Security Investigations have been pulled from serious investigations like sex crimes, child exploitation, and other atrocities to perform administrative functions at the border. One whistleblower claimed that his team was told to shut down its investigations and were then sent to the border to make sandwiches. The Secretary has abused his authority and put Americans at risk. Secretary Mayorkas has repeatedly lied to the American people and to the United States Congress. Our investigation undercovered more than 100 instances where Secretary Mayorkas misled the public. Notably, he claimed in April 2022, hearing to have operational control of the southwest border as defined by federal statute. This was false. He then told another uh, lie by claiming in subsequent hearings that he does not use the statutory definition of operational control, despite doing so in that 2022 hearing. Watch for yourself. Will you testify under oath right now? Do we have operational control, yes or no? Yes, we do. And we have we operational are, control of the borders. Yes, we do. And, Congressman, and we are working to... So what operational control defined? In this section, the term operational control means the prevention of all unlawful entries into the United States, including entries by terrorists, other unlawful aliens, instruments of terrorism, narcotics, and other contraband. Do you stand by in your testimony that we have operational control in light of this definition? And Congressman, I think the um, Secretary of Homeland Security would have said the same thing in 2020 and in it, 2019. That's the definition and of operational control. Based upon the control. definition you have, sir, up there, no. We don't have operational control. No, sir. With respect to the definition of operational control, I do not use the definition that appears in the Secure Fence Act. Do you admit that your policies have led the country farther away from operational control of the border as defined by the Congress? 
Congressman, no, I did not. If you will recall when you testified here in front of me when I asked that question, when you very clearly stated, we do have operational control, when presented with the actual definition of operational control, you didn't hesitate, you said, I do, and you in fact then referred back and said, I believe that my predecessors would have said the same thing. You looked straight at the American people, straight at me, straight at every, every person on this committee, and said, we have operational control. Why? Congressman, two points. One, you did not let me complete my answer. Two. Oh, hold on. That, or let's give me your second point. Go ahead. Thank you. Two. Two. The Secure Fence Act defines operational control as not a single individual crosses the border. I'm aware. I read it. And I read it to you. And you read it. And in fact, you said, I do. You didn't hesitate. You didn't say, I do. I need, I need to explain what I mean by I do. You said, I do, over and over again. Secretary Merrick has told this very committee in September 2021, and I quote, the border is no less secure than it was previously, end quote. CBP recorded more than 192,000 encounters at our border that month alone, compared to around 58,000 the prior September. It was clear the border was not secure, so why did he mislead Congress? Another video, please. Is the border more secure under your leadership than when you started? Uh, Congressman, the border is secure. We're executing our plan, and I've been very clear and unequivocal in that regard. Mr. I Secretary, said, the question is, is the border more secure now under your leadership? Congressman, it is no less secure than it was previously. We have a record number of retirements, historic level of narcotics that have come across the border, and you still stand by your statement, yes or no, that the border is secure? Yes. He even stood at the White House podium in September 21 and falsely accused mounting border patrol, mounted border patrol agents in the Del Rio sector of whipping illegal aliens crossing the border. Earlier that same day, DHS emails showed that his staff had informed him that an eyewitness said no whipping occurred, yet he advanced the narrative at the highest levels anyway. One sector chief told us, and I quote, we never whipped anybody. It was never really cleared up, and that takes a toll on our agents, end quote. Please play the video. We are very troubled by what we have seen. Uh, one cannot weaponize a horse uh, to aggressively attack a child. We know that those images painfully conjured up the worst elements of our nation's ongoing battle against systemic racism. Uh, first of all, uh, the images, as I expressed uh, earlier, uh, the images horrified us in terms of what they suggest and what they conjure up in terms of not only our nation's history, but unfortunately the fact that that page of history has not been turned entirely. And that means that there is much work to do and we are very focused on doing it. An email obtained through a records request reveals that DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was privately alerted by DHS officials that the whipping narrative behind the infamous horseback border patrol photos wasn't true. But at a press conference hours later, Mayorkas didn't stop or dispute that narrative. This is just a taste of Secretary Mayorkas's misconduct. However, I want to close by reminding everyone that we're here today, not only because House Republicans are determined to hold Secretary Mayorkas accountable, but because more than 200 House Democrats voted on November the 13th to refer articles of impeachment to our committee. We're now acting in a bipartisan way, I suppose, in taking up those very articles. And I briefly want to make it clear to the American people, Secretary Mayorkas's refusal to follow the law is sufficient grounds for impeachment, impeachment proceedings. The constitutional history is overwhelmingly clear on this subject. The founders designed impeachment not just to remove officials engaged in criminal behavior, but those guilty of such gross incompetence that their conduct had endangered their fellow Americans, betrayed the public trust, or represented a neglect of duty. According to one scholar, there is, and I quote, a settled understanding beyond dispute 
that impeachable offenses are not limited to prosecutable crimes. Rather, the framers of the Constitution understood, and the House of Representatives has consistently concluded, that the impeachment power reaches all manner of gross misconduct in office that does serious harm to the U.S. political system, the U.S. constitutional order, or the people of the country. The actions, policies, and statements of Secretary Mayorkas easily meet the standards, end quote. Over the next few hours, you might hear a lot about process and procedure, and after a thorough year-long investigation, this committee is following the Constitution and procedure as directed by the House's vote this past November. Make no mistake, attacks on the integrity of the process are meant to distract you from the deadly consequences of our open border. Unprecedented cartel control of our southwest border with record amounts of fentanyl flooding across between ports of entry and into our communities, killing tens of thousands of Americans every year. Over 300 individuals on the terrorist watch list apprehended illegally crossing the southwest border since FY 2021, compared to just 14 from FY 2017 to 2020. Families devastated by violent criminal aliens who have committed murder, rape, and assault, to say nothing of the vehicular crimes committed. CBP and ICE personnel losing faith in their, in their mission. They and their families bearing the brunt of this onslaught at the border. The human costs of this crisis are very real. The dollar costs of this crisis have been astronomical as well. New York City alone projects that it will have, have to spend $12 billion dealing with the flow of illegal aliens into the city by 2025. And it is even cutting the police force to pay for it. One county in Texas had to cut salaries to afford, bur to afford burials and cremations of illegal aliens found dead in their jurisdiction. These costs will be felt for years to come. As I stated when we started this investigation almost a year ago, we will follow the facts. We have done just that, and the facts have led us here. I look forward to the testimonies of these distinguished attorneys general who have watched this crisis play out unabated in their states. For the sake of our homeland security and the well-being of the people of the United States, Secretary Mayorkas must be held accountable. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in April, before this committee even began its so-called impeachment inquiry, Chairman Green promised donors at a campaign event that he'd bring an impeachment case against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. According to a recording of his comments obtained by the media, the chairman went on to tell those deep pocket contributors to, quote, get the popcorn and, quote, it's going to be fun. The chairman may have thought that only those in the campaign event would hear his remarks, but the truth has a way of coming out. His promise to a room full of donors tell the American people all they need to know about why Republicans are hell bent on impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. The promise of impeachment was made at a campaign event, and shortly afterwards, Republicans began their so-called investigation into Secretary Mayorkas. It is now campaign season, and Republicans re recently rolled out their impeachment proceedings against Secretary like a pre-planned, predetermined political stunt it is. This is not a legitimate impeachment. Republicans want to throw political red meat to their base and keep that campaign cash coming. They know their already razor-thin majority is slipping away and think impeaching Secretary Mayorkas, even though there's absolutely no basis for it, will keep them in control of the House. Republicans certainly aren't going to win votes based on their abysmal legislative record, this has been the most unproductive, dysfunctional Congress in memory. They kicked their own speaker out and then couldn't agree on a new one. They paralyzed the House for weeks while they fought among themselves. They've struggled to keep the government funding and are continually on the verge of shutting it down. A member of their party was expelled for lying about practically everything in his life. 
Extreme mega Republicans have created this impeachment circus sideshow in part to try to distract from their own failures. They took their sideshow on the road recently, traveling to the border to stand behind a podium, making canned speeches and posing for photo ops. But for all their border security bluster, Republicans oppose funding necessary to secure the border. They tried to cut money from Customs and Border Protection personnel and have refused to take up the president's supplemental funding request. <laughs> Chairman Green himself recently penned an op-ed saying, and I quote, not another dime to DHS, unquote. Until the Republican border bill is signed into law, even though he knows full well that disastrous bill has absolutely zero chance of being enacted. It should be unthinkable that a chairman of the Committee on Homeland Security would threaten to defund DHS, but that's exactly what happened. This is funding our frontline border and immigration agencies need to better secure the border. Republicans have tried to excuse their opposition to border funding by claiming that Border Patrol doesn't want more funding, but that is blatantly false. In interviews with the committee, Border Patrol chiefs unequivocally supported more resources. Republicans know that. They were in the room, and they have the transcripts. But let me refresh their memory. Jason Owens, currently the chief of the Border Patrol, said, we always need more agents. Chief Modlin in Tucson, an agency, we need a lot more, a lot more people. From Chief Heike in San Diego, we always need resources and technology. From Chief Bovino in El Centro, the additional resources is the correct technology assist with control of the border. And finally, from Chief Savez in El Paso, providing support for critical positions and resources by Congress really does impact positively the deployment of agents to the front line. Every one of these chiefs told the committee that having more resources would help them better secure the border. Republicans go to the border in dress pants and polo shirts to pose for pictures, but then leave the hardworking agents in uniform and work boots behind without the resources they ask for. Democrats want to give border agents what they need to secure the border, and Republicans do not. The truth is, securing the border isn't really the Republicans' top concern. If it was, They'd provide the people with boots on the ground at the border what they need to get the job done. Republicans would rather exploit a challenging policy issue for their own perceived political gain. Republicans disagree with the Biden administration's border and immigration policies. They are angry that this administration won't take babies from their moms or put kids in cages like the last administration. You cannot impeach a cabinet secretary because you don't like the president's policies. Let me say that again. You cannot impeach a cabinet secretary because you don't like a president's policies. That's not what impeachment's for. That's not what the Constitution says. Republicans are willing to do grave damage to the Constitution they claim to hold dear because they think it will benefit them politically. And in doing so, they are targeting Secretary Mayorkas, a public servant who spent his distinguished 30-year career serving our country as a federal prosecutor and in leadership positions across the Department of Homeland Security. The facts show Secretary Mayorkas is doing his job across the department's many critical homeland security missions, including border security and immigration enforcement. Despite what Republicans would have Americans believe, Secretary Mayorkas is enforcing immigration law. According to a recent analysis by the Cato Institute, someone who crosses the border under the current administration is more likely to be removed from the U.S. 
than someone who crossed under former President Trump. Republicans don't care about that. This impeachment sham clearly is about, isn't about facts. It's not about the law. It's about pure and simple politics. Just look at those whose impeachment resolutions have been referred to this committee. Consider what kind of backroom deals Republican leadership must have made with the most extreme mega members. Or as one Republican member recently put it, and I quote, we are simply accommodating our least sensible conference members. I certainly agree. Democrats are doing everything they can to hold the line against Republican chaos. Democrats want to strengthen border security. We want to keep fentanyl off the streets. We want to keep communities safe. This circle side show impeachment does none of that. Mr. Chairman, let's drop this baseless impeachment and start doing the real work of securing the homeland for the American people. Before I yield back, however, Mr. Chairman, I have some parliamentary inquiries. Uh, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, isn't it true that there is no language in either Rule 10 or Rule 11 that grants the Committee on Homeland Security jurisdiction over the impeachment of any federal officer? That is not a valid parliamentary uh, inquiry. You need to state the rule and how it relates to this proceeding. Uh, that's why it's an inquiry, because I'm referencing either Rule 10 or Rule 11 that grants the Committee of Homeland Security jurisdiction over impeachment of any officer. There was a vote on the House floor, actually the motion made by the Democrats to move impeachment articles to this committee. Uh, that trumps the rules, uh, and it passed the House floor, and we are proceeding in accordance with the demands of the United States House of Representatives by vote of the members. For the parliamentary inquiry. Gentleman is recognized. Is the chair aware that of the five resolutions impeaching Secretary Mayorkas introduced in the House so far this Congress, just one, House Resolution 863, has been referred to the Committee of Homeland Security, and that four others have been referred by the Speaker to the Committee on Ju Judiciary. Again, uh, I need to know the rule that you uh, think this is in violation of, so it's uh, not a um, correct parliamentary inquiry. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand your, your ruling. Not a valid parliamentary inquiry. Further parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Gentlemen Chairman. Gentlemen recognized. Would the chair inform the committee of which rule or precedent supports the idea that the motion to refer overrides House rules on committee jurisdiction, particularly over a constitutional matter that should have been referred to the committee on judiciary. It is, that is not a valid parliamentary inquiry. Further parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman is recognized. Has the full House authorized this impeachment inquiry, such as it did on January 14, 1876, for the investigation of then Secretary of War William W. Belknap, or such as the House did on December 13, 2023, for the investigation of President Biden. Again, not a valid parliamentary inquiry. The House of Representatives voted to send this to this committee. Further parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman is recognized. Is the chair aware that the Committee on the Judiciary adopted internal rules of procedure for the conduct of its impeachment inquiry of ex-President Trump in 2019? And does the chair intend to follow suit 
and adopt additional committee rules to ensure due process for Secretary Mayorkas in this as yet unauthorized inquiry. Again, not a valid parliamentary inquiry. Uh, further parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman is recognized. And in reference to the Secretary's right to due process, I have the following parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Does the committee intend to follow the Secretary to be represented by counsel during these impeachment proceedings? The committee will follow the rules of the House on that measure. So, so do I understand that Secretary Mayorkas will be allowed counsel? The committee will follow the rules of the House on that. For the parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman is recognized. Does the committee intend to allow the Secretary's counsel to be present at all hearings and depositions? The committee will follow the rules of the House. Additional inquiry. The gentleman is recognized. Does the committee intend to allow the secretary's counsel to present evidence and object to the admission of evidence? The committee will follow the rules of the House. Is that a no? The committee will follow the rules of the House. So do the rules allow? That's, that's, that's my point. We will follow the rules of the House as they are written, um, and the question isn't pertinent to this committee hearing today. Well, I think we'll, we'll get to that at some point, Mr. Chairman, but I just want to go on the record in pursuit of this is that when former President Trump had impeachment uh, matters brought before uh, Senator Lindsey Graham made sure that he was afforded counsel and questions and everything. And I'm just trying to make sure that, that we follow some kind of order <coughs> in that. As, as I stated, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, we will follow the rules of the House. All right. Thank you. Uh, for the parliamentary inquiry, does yep. the committee intend to allow the Secretary's counsel to call and cross-examine witnesses? Again, the committee will follow the rules of the House. Further parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman's recognized. Does the committee intend to give the Secretary's counsel access to and the ability to respond to the evidence added by the committee? The committee will follow all of the rules of the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. <clears throat> Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I'm pleased to have distingu a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today, and I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. I would now like to formally introduce our witnesses. Mr. Knudsen, Austin Knudsen was uh, sworn in as Montana's 25th Attorney General on January the 4th, 2021. Prior to that, he was elected to the Montana House of Representatives in 2010. From 2015 to 2019, he served as the Speaker of the Montana House of Representatives. Gentner Drummond was sworn in as Oklahoma's 19th Attorney General on January the 9th, 2023. Mr. Drummond's law experience spans nearly 30 years and includes service as an assistant district attorney in Pawnee and uh, us, how do you pronounce it? Osage counties, and as an attorney in private practice. Andrew Bailey was sworn in as the 44th Attorney General of the state of Missouri on January the 3rd, 2023. Mr. Bailey is a veteran of the United States Army in which he served in combat as a commissioned officer following the terrorist attacks of September 11. Mr. Frank Bowman is the University of Missouri's Curator's Distinguished Professor Emeritus and Floyd R. Gibson, Missouri Endowed Professor of Law Emeritus 
at the University of Missouri School of Law. He has also taught at Georgetown University Law Center, Washington and Lee University, Gonzaga University, Indiana University's McKinney School of Law, Wake Forest University, and the University of Denver. And in spring of 2023, was visiting fellow at Oxford University's Rothermere American Institute. I thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I now recognize Mr. Knudsen for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the Distinguished Committee, my name is Austin Knudsen, Montana Attorney General. As the Attorney General and Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the State of Montana, I'm grateful for this committee's attention to how Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas' failed leadership has impacted states like Montana. The southern border certainly presents a difficult challenge for any administration. But Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration have absolutely poured gasoline on this fire. The southern border and the drugs flowing across it into communities large and small across our nation are ultimately the reason that I am the Attorney General of Montana today. I'm from rural Montana, where I was a private practice attorney, until two drug dealers sped past my kids' school, one shooting at the other out of his vehicle window in broad daylight. After that incident, I became our elected county prosecutor where I saw what I thought were the absolute worst things possible. Babies born addicted to drugs, kids thrown into foster care because their parents would rather buy drugs than take care of them, young girls sexually assaulted by family members on drugs, people murdered over $20 drug deals gone wrong. So to say that I was encouraged by the previous administration's progress in securing our nation's border is an understatement. It's also an understatement to say that I was horrified to see this administration under Secretary Mayorkas' leadership begin to erase that progress and systematically dismantle policies and programs meant to secure our borders. The most devastating impact of the open border on Montana has been the massive quantities of Mexican cartel fentanyl and methamphetamine. In 2020, drug task forces in Montana seized 6,663 doses units of fentanyl. In 2021, the first year of Secretary Mayorkas' watch at the border, that quantity exploded tenfold to 61,000 dosage units of fentanyl. In 2022, Montana tripled that seizing nearly 190,000 dosage units of cartel fentanyl. The numbers aren't finalized yet for 2023, but I can tell you that as of the third quarter of 2023, Montana is on track to have seized nearly a half million dosage units of fentanyl and another 200 pounds of meth. And the cartels trafficked 100% of that fentanyl and meth across the southern border. In just one week during March 2022, 17 people on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation overdosed on fentanyl. Four of them died. I spoke with a woman later that year from the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, which is where I'm from. She was raising her grandkids because both of her sons were killed in two separate fentanyl overdose incidents. Nationwide, indigenous people suffer the highest rate of fentanyl overdoses. In Montana, the opioid overdose death rate among Native Americans is twice that of white people. The devastation of Secretary Mayorkas' refusal to faithfully execute the laws goes beyond the deaths it causes and the anguish families left to pick up pieces. These drugs cause people to do absolutely unspeakable things. A suspect in a current drug case in Montana was taking delivery of drugs that were being supplied directly from the cartels in Mexico. She kept her minor daughter living in a yard shed and allowed the man delivering those drugs to sexually assault her daughter as part of that drug deal. In another case last year, a young mother who was homeless was able to finally find a bedroom in a house, not knowing that that room had been recently occupied by a fentanyl user. Shortly after taking residence, that mother found her 11-month-old child not breathing. 
Fortunately, medical and law enforcement personnel responded quickly enough to administer naloxone before the fentanyl from the prior occupant killed that infant child. The Trump administration overcame fierce opposition at every turn and was able to gain control of our southern border as no previous administration could. But all of that progress has been destroyed. Secretary Mayorkas is the architect of that destruction. The American people are watching. They know that our border was secure just a few years ago. They see the devastation metastasizing in our communities from drugs and human trafficking. The conclusion is clear. Secretary Mayorkas has violated his oath, and I urge this body to impeach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Knudsen. I, I now recognize Mr. Drummond for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to participate today in this hearing on this critical issue. I am Gettner Drummond, and I was elected Oklahoma's Attorney General in 2022. As the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of Oklahoma, it is my duty to protect the people of my state. I'm here to testify about the dangers my citizens face due to a porous border and the failure of our federal government to enforce its laws. In the early evening of November 20, 2022, law enforcement responded to a quadruple homicide after a Chinese national allegedly entered a garage on a 10-acre marijuana farm in rural Oklahoma. According to investigators, the assailant killed three men, execution style, with gunshots to the back of their head, and one woman with two shots to her abdomen. The carnage of that day is but one tragic example of a failed system played, plagued by failing leadership. Throughout Oklahoma, law enforcement comes into contact daily with foreign nationals who have entered our country illegally or who remain here illegally or both. This is all too common in Oklahoma's illegal marijuana grow operations. The voters of Oklahoma legalized medical marijuana in 2018. While that legalization led to the legitimate cannabis business related businesses throughout our state, organized criminals have overtaken the industry. Our law enforcement partners report that the foreign nationals most often involved in these illegal enterprises come from China and Mexico. The one thing these criminals have in common is that they have no regard for our laws or public safety. Criminal illegal immigrants are not content with growing only black market marijuana. They also produce and distribute fentanyl, and they engage in sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Oklahoma's law enforcement community fights a constant battle against these evils. The Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, and scores of local law enforcement agencies deserve much praise for their great and heroic efforts. While there have been many great successes, the ongoing border crisis ensures a never-ending flood of illegal foreign na nationals who continue to perpetrate crimes that endanger our people. When I was sworn in as Attorney General, I pledged to the people of my state that I would do everything in my power to protect them from these dangerous criminals. I petition our legislature for greater resources and broader authority to combat the threat. They responded with millions of dollars for equipment and personnel, and they granted my office more power to fight this criminal epidemic being fueled by our border crisis. In response, I established the Organized Crime Task Force, the first of its kind for Oklahoma, and it is needed primarily because federal officials have failed to enforce the laws and to secure our border. In the short seven months since its creation, the Organized Crime Task Force has investigated and is prosecuting more than 50 complex, multi-jurisdictional criminal cases. The vast majority of these cases involve Mexican or Chinese drug syndicates. These illegal foreign actors burden my state with additional costs that cannot be fully quantified. For instance, the Oklahoma Department of Corrections reports that it is currently housing more than 500 illegal immigrants convicted various violent crimes. Before those criminal aliens were sent to the Department of Corrections, they were in custody of our local jails, which have their own costs for housing. Likewise, there is a significant cost for law enforcement in the investigating of these crimes and for the prosecutors who prosecute them. The unsecure border contributes to costs beyond the criminal justice system as well. While it is not possible to ascertain the exact amount of the cost, it is easy to understand the magnitude. Illegal immigration costs Oklahoma taxpayers more than $750 million each year 
with a minimal offset return. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I believe it is time for accountability. The people of Oklahoma don't deserve to live under constant threat from criminal foreign nationals. We don't deserve to have our communities flooded with illegal drugs that were smuggled across an unsecure border. And we don't deserve to have our loved ones ripped away by those same drugs. I ask you to remember the people of Oklahoma as you did deliberate, remember the murder victims, remember the drug overdose victims, and the families who mourn them. And of course, please remember the law enforcement officers who risk their lives every day to protect us from it all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Drummond. I now recognize Mr. Bailey for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. My understanding of border security comes from direct, hands-on experience securing a nation's border. It was earned on a barren desert battlefield half a world away from the turret of an M2 Bradley fighting vehicle. In 2005, as a newly minted second lieutenant in the United States Army, my platoon deployed to the Nineveh province, Iraq, under the command of then Colonel H.R. McMaster, it was tasked with securing the border between Iraq and Syria. Our mission was simple, close the border. And that's exactly what we did. We did not capture people and release them into the interior of the country. We did not hand out citations and ask individuals to report back in 10 years. No, we closed the border to ensure the country was safe. Since 2021, more than 8 million illegal immigrants have entered the United States, and that is more than the population of my home state of Missouri. These numbers are not an accident. There is only one reason 8 million people illegally cross a sovereign nation's border, because they know that they can get away with it, and why wouldn't they? In the last three years of Secretary Mayorkas' reign, there, have been, there has been an orchestrated lack of enforcement of our nation's immigration laws. He has failed to do that, which is most fundamental to his mission, protect our border. That failure has not only led to today's impeachment proceeding, it has given rise to an unprecedented level of state actions necessary to fill the vacuum created by the Secretary's refusal to do his job. I'd like to highlight for you a few of the actions my office has taken as we fight to secure the southern border. One of those is our fight to force him to finish President Trump's border wall. In an interview last Wednesday on CNN, Secretary Mayorkas stated, we need additional resources and we need them now. Our lawsuit proves he already has funding, he just refuses to use it. In fiscal year 2020, Congress appropriated funds explicitly for the purpose of constructing barrier systems at our southern border to keep unauthorized individuals out of our country. In the appropriation, Congress explicitly stated the money shall only be available for the construction of barrier systems along the southwest border. Secretary Mayorkas and his administration refused to comply with Congress's command. Missouri immediately filed suit. DHS attempted to argue we did not have standing to challenge its refusal to use the funds, but the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that states can indeed bring such a challenge. That ruling cleared the way for our lawsuit against the Secretary's refusal to finish President Trump's border wall, and it allowed the lawsuit to move forward. So while we battle in court over Secretary Mayorkas' refusal to use taxpayer dollars in the manner Congress explicitly prescribed, we have little sympathy for his pleas for more resources. Rather than find ways to secure our border, Secretary Mayorkas has been busy enacting policies to make it easier to enter our country illegally. We filed suit again against May Secretary Mayorkas for allowing hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants to be paroled into the United States every year. Parole allows non-citizens to physically enter and remain in the United States for up to two years or even longer while their application is reviewed without lawful status. We also filed suit to halt Secretary Mayorkas' attempt to implement a rule that redefined what had previously been considered an illegal border crossing as a lawful pathway. Rather than acknowledge the root cause of the influx of illegal immigrants pouring over our border, the Secretary tried to define the problem away by simply making something that was once illegal something legal without congressional authorization. Mayorkas' process would allow vast numbers of illegal immigrants to enter the country and receive instant work authorization under bogus asylum claims. Secretary Mayorkas has enacted illegal policies that are akin to posting a come in, we're open sign along the southern border. Without taking responsibility for the consequences of his actions, states are then forced to bear the enormous cost of Secretary Mayorkas' failure. The states should not need to do the federal government's job for them. Secretary Mayorkas swore an oath to faithfully execute the laws of our land. In Missouri, we remove officials who do not do their jobs because we have seen firsthand the catastrophic toll it takes on entire communities. My office was forced to take action to remove a Soros-backed prosecuting attorney from office for her refusal to do her job that resulted in the killing and maiming 
of countless Missourians. Since we took action, order has been restored to the city of St. Louis. It is rightful for Congress to consider removing a government official who refuses to do his job for the same reason, to restore order. We have reached a point of no return. We're doing everything we can at the state level to rectify this disaster, but Congress has a role to play for accountability. While we battle in the nation's courts, Congress must use every tool at its disposal to obtain accountability for the American people. I thank the committee for its time and welcome its questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bailey. I now recognize Mr. Bowman for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee, I'm honored to address this committee, and I'm also pleased to share the witness table with three distinguished elected officials, one of whom immediately to my right, Mr. Bailey, I last remember seeing around 2011 as a second-year law student in my evidence class at Mizzou. Um, as Attorney General of Missouri, he's surely come up in the world. Um, congratulations to you from an old professor. I, on the other hand, remain simply an old professor. Uh, I understand this to be the first in a series of hearings on whether constitutional grounds exist to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The testimony so far has focused on the performance of Secretary Mayorkas and the Biden administration relating to immigration policy and enforcement. I'm not an, an expert on immigration policy. I will not comment on it here. I have, however, been studying constitutional standards for impeachment for over 25 years. I've written numerous articles uh, and a book on the history of impeachment from its origins in England in 1376 through the two impeachments of President Trump. My subject, therefore, will be the constitutional standard for impeaching a cabinet officer. The key point about, the, about impeachment in our Constitution is that it is not supposed to be a routine tool to resolve ordinary public policy debates, even very passionate ones. Uh, debates between political parties or between one House of Congress and the executive branch. It is instead a measure of last resort, reserved, as one framer put it, for great and dangerous offenses. In other words, for official misconduct, which is extraordinarily serious in degree and critically of a type that corrupts or subverts governmental processes or the constitutional order itself. That the framers intended impeachment to be rare is obvious from their decision that conviction requires two-thirds of the Senate. That they intended to rule it out as a weapon of ordinary political debate is plain from how they defined impeachable conduct. The Constitution provides that the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. A cabinet secretary is a civil officer subject to impeachment, but a cabinet secretary, like the president, is not impeachable unless he's proven to have committed treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. There's no suggestion that I'm aware of that Secretary Mayorkas has committed either treason or bribery. Hence, any article of impeachment against him must establish that he committed high crimes and misdemeanors. The framers chose the English parliamentary term of art, high crimes and misdemeanors, rather than other possible terms like maladministration, because they wanted a flexible term that could reach unanticipated new forms of grave official misconduct, but equally and critically because they did not want an impeachment that would be the equivalent of a vote of no confidence in modern parliamentary systems, a vote that could remove the president or other executive branch officials between elections whenever the legislature disapproves of administration policy. For over two centuries, students of the Constitution have universally agreed, in the words of the great impeachment scholar Charles Black, that whatever may be the grounds for impeachment and removal, dislike of a president's policy is certainly not one of them. To be properly impeachable, official conduct must meet a very high threshold of seriousness. It must also be of a type that corrupts and subverts the political and governmental process and it ought to be plainly wrong regardless of legal technicalities. The most commonly encountered categories of impeachable conduct are official corruption, abuse of power, betrayal of the nation's foreign policy interests, and subversion of the Constitution. There is no serious allegation of which I'm aware that the Secretary has done any of those things. Now, some might mischaracterize the Secretary's implementation of the President's policy priorities as an abuse of power, but impeachable abuse of power involves employing the powers of office or illegal or, or illegitimate ends, particularly to gain personal, political, or financial advantage, to benefit personal or political allies, or to injure political or, or personal enemies, and especially when the abusive exercise of official power undermines constitutional values. 
Following the policy directives of one's elected superior in pursuit of that superior's policy aims is simply not an impeachable abuse of power. Finally, impeachment of a cabinet secretary over policy agreements is not only contrary to long-established constitutional understanding, but useless as a practical matter. If the official actions of the officer are in accord with the directives of his elected superior, the president, removing the secretary changes nothing. If members of this committee disapprove of the Biden administration's immigration and border policies, the, Congress give, the, the, the Constitution gives this Congress a wealth of legislative powers to change them. Impeachment is not one of those powers. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Uh, members will be uh, recognized by order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. An additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Uh, this is uh, for the three attorneys general. Do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas has failed to enforce or has subverted laws passed by the United States Congress? And we'll start and go left to right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yes, uh, or no. yes or no? Yes, sir. He has failed to perform his duties and is culpably inefficient. Has he uh, failed to enforce laws passed by the U.S. Congress? He has. Mr. Yes, sir. He is, Secretary Mayorkas is acting in violation of the law and in violation of constitutional order by negating Congress's appropriations authority and directives in the appropriations bill and undermining the rule of law by perverting the plain text of the statutes as it relates to the parole process and its promulgation of the circumvention rule. Thank you. Uh, do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas, again, we're going to hit the three of you, uh, do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas has defied court orders issued by the United States courts, which I can cite if you want me to, but I'm sure you're probably aware of them. Do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas has defied court orders issued by the courts, federal courts? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes, and it should never come to having to go to court against Secretary Mayorkas because he should be following the laws enacted by this body. Thank you. Uh, in testimony to Chip Roy before the House of Representatives, you saw some of the video there, the Secretary said yes to the question of whether DHS possessed operational control of the Southwest border as defined by the Secure Fence Act. Uh, I might add act, meaning uh, the, or the Congress passed it. In subsequent testimony to the Senate, Secretary Mayorkas stated that no one has ever had operational control of the border and that he does not use that definition of operational control as defined by the Secure Fence Act. Given these statements, do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas misled Congress while under oath in describing DHS's operational control of the border? Again, gentlemen, the three of you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. I believe he politicized his answer and failed to be authentic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland acknowledged in testimony to the United States Senate that drug cartels were exploiting the current Mayorkas policies in order to traffic humans and harmful drugs into the United States. Secretary Mayorkas on March 28, 23 stated that he was unaware of this. Now, we of course informed him, now armed with this knowledge, Mayorkas continues the same policies, in fact doubling down with newer policies that even exacerbate the same horrible outcomes. Do you think Secretary Mayorkas is doing this with full knowledge that these cartels are exploiting his policies? Mr. Chairman, there's no doubt there's ample evidence out there that tra human trafficking and drug trafficking are increasing at an exponential level at the southern border, yes. And Mr. Sure. Chairman, based on my testimony today and the facts that are well known by the Secretary, there's a porous border that's feeding constantly illegal actors in Oklahoma. Mr. Bailey. Yes, his unlawful behaviors as it relates to the circumvention rule and subversion of the parole process exacerbate and encourage the cartels and cede control of the border to the cartels in ways unimaginable prior to these policy positions. Thank you. <clears throat> Where impeachment is concerned, the scale is very important. How would you describe the scale or comparable size of this border crisis based on your law enforcement experience? And we'll start with Mr. Kinn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, based on my prior prosecuting experience, I can tell you since 2020, the fentanyl and human trafficking specifically, uh, well, fentanyl and methamphetamine trafficking have increased in my state. There, there's no other word than meteoric. 
I can tell you about the first fentanyl case that I prosecuted in 2019. Um, that was a relatively small amount for, by today's standards, but at the time we thought that was a large bust. And again, that was in 2019. Uh, our, our seizure numbers from our various drug task forces, uh, our, better, uh, our various federal partnerships bear that out categorically. Fentanyl in Montana is by far our largest public safety issue and it is it's just exploded under this administration. Our seizure numbers bear that out. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sort of interrupt my own question because my time is running out. I know Mr. Bowman mentioned the term great and dangerous threat to the United States. I'll ask the last two of you, do you feel that the hundreds of thousands who've died to fentanyl overdose, the crime that's exponentially increased, the uh, uh, increase in terrorist activity, or you know, terrorists coming across the southern border, do you think it's great and dangerous, Mr. Drennan? It is great and dangerous. We have collision between Chinese and Mexican cartels. Mr. Bailey, very quickly. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the Missouri State Highway Patrol, a single law enforcement agency in the state of Missouri last year, seized 12,500 grams of fentanyl. It's enough to kill every Missourian. Uh, thank you. And uh, I yield. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've been on this committee since its inception and have served as a top Democrat since 2005. During that time, Democrats and Republicans have engaged in spirited debate over policy, both uh, with each other and with various administrations. At the end of the day, however, we always came together to make the homeland more secure for the American people. This has been our committee's reputation, and as a point of pride for me and all my Republican counterparts uh, from chairs and ranking members. Today marks a dramatic shift from the committee's record of sensible bipartisan policymaking. We used to come together to resolve policy disputes, but now Republicans are trying to use the awesome power of impeachment instead. The Constitution doesn't let us do that. The Constitution requires high crimes and misdemeanors. Professor Bowman, as Secretary Mayorkas, uh, in your opinion, committed high crimes and misdemeanors to meet that requirement? Based on all the information available to me, I have not found uh, any indication that he's committed high crimes and misdemeanors, no. Uh, thank you. Over the weekend, we observed the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, during which thousands of angry Trump supporters who had whipped into a frenzy by Donald Trump, marched from the White House to the Capitol to obstruct the democratic process. And let's be clear, those individuals were acting on the orders of Donald Trump, who told them, quote, we fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're going to not have a country anymore, unquote. That night, most of us were unified in our disgust over the attack on the Capitol and the democratic process. Almost immediately, however, that unity eroded. In the end, only 10 Republicans voted to impeach Donald Trump for engaging in high crimes and misdemeanors by inciting violence against the government of the United States. Professor Bowman, as a constitutional expert, would you agree that inciting an insurrection to obstruct a peaceful transfer of power is an impeachable offense? I do agree, and I think it's notable that not only did 10 members of this body vote to impeach Donald Trump, but when the case went to trial in the Senate, uh, seven Republican members of the Senate uh, voted for that precise proposition. There was indeed a majority for convicting uh, Mr. Trump of high crimes and misdemeanors, albeit not the two-thirds majority that was required uh, under the Constitution. And yet only 10 Republicans uh, voted to impeach Donald Trump for conduct that is clearly an impeachable offense. But today, Republicans are attempting to impeach Secretary Mayorkas where there are clearly no grounds. Mr. Chairman, this impeachment is a sham and the height of hypocrisy on the part of my colleagues across the aisle. I urge Republicans to put politics aside and get back 
to the work for the American people. I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. McCall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a solemn uh, occasion, uh, probably the most uh, serious obligation we have uh, in this committee, on this committee. The last time a cabinet member was impeached was during the administration of Ulysses S. Grant uh, many years ago. In my experience, though, as a deputy attorney general for criminal justice, state of Texas is a federal prosecutor charged with counterterrorism and national security. Uh, and as chairman of this very committee, I've never seen this border more out of control. My work has took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. In my judgment, he has violated that oath. Federal law provides a government detain and remove aliens convicted of crimes and those who are issued removal orders by immigration courts. This is the very issue that my state took up on appeal to the Supreme Court. He has violated this. On day one, he rescinded Remain in Mexico migrant protection protocol, direct cause and effect, opening the floodgates. I marked that provision up on my committee, Foreign Affairs. It's now part of HR2. But he took that power away from his law enforcement officers. And I have to quote, I don't quote former Texas Congresswoman Barbara Jordan very often, but she said, quote, for the system to be credible, people actually have to be deported at the end of the process. And let's look at the numbers. They speak for themselves. Eight million encounters under this administration, 2.3 aliens in the interior of the United States with no legal status, enough to fill up 13 states. Just last month, we had over 300,000 trying to get into the United States. Over 300 on the terror watch list have gotten into the United States. When I chaired this committee, that was a big red flag, and the FBI director said so when he testified as well. Over 200,000 Americans have died from fentanyl. I personally went to a funeral last Saturday. One of my children's friends died from Xanax laced with fentanyl. 200,000 Americans, that's more than triple the number of Americans who died in the Vietnam War, to put that into perspective. The Secretary has an emboldened a criminal enterprise and the biggest human trafficking scheme in my lifetime. He terminated MPP. Chief Ortiz noted that had a direct cause and effect. And when Marcus went down to the border, they turned their backs on him because, quote, sir, you have turned your back on us. My state has spent almost $14 billion just uh, this cycle. We've allocated $9.6 billion to Operation Lone Star. My governor bust illegals to sanctuary cities and states around the country to showcase what we are experiencing, and you are as well in your states, every single day. And the damage was clear. The Supreme Court did note the damage, but said that, that this had to be resolved outside the courts. In other words, they said that Congress had to address this either through appropriations, oversight, and in Sam Alito's decision, yes, through impeachment. This is a legal justification for these proceedings. The founders believed impeachable offenses included corrupt administration, neglect of duty, and official misconduct at the Constitutional Convention. They said this. Alexander Hamilton asserted abuse or violation of public trust was impeachable. Justice Story, Supreme Court, public office is a public trust, and a violation of public trust is sufficient. I find this to be a, a profound violation of public trust. Alexander Hamilton stated in Federalist Paper 65, the subjects of impeachment are a nature which may be denounced political, as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to society itself. My God. What about the injuries done to society that we've seen? To our three illustrious attorneys general, please tell me the injuries done to your societies back home, and do you think this secretary merits and that impeachment is warranted in this case? Thank you, Representative. Um, I think the most powerful statistic I can give you from my state is our confirmed state crime lab fentanyl overdose death rate. 
Since 2019, Montana's confirmed fentanyl overdose deaths have increased 1,700%. Congressman, I think that is the absolute strongest indicator. We know where these drugs are coming from. It's not a political statement of mine. It's not an opinion of mine to say that 100% of that fentanyl came from the Mexican drug cartels. We know that to be true. We get that from our federal partners in the DEA. We get that from all of our drug task forces, and all, all the law enforcement agencies that are under my purview. And just real quickly, General Drummond and, and Bailey, just very quickly. We have witnessed a, a mass collusion between Chinese nationals coming through the southern border uh, in concert with Mexican cartels. 1,500 fentanyl deaths, 43 children dead from accidental poisoning from exposure to fentanyl, $114 million borne by taxpayers and increased health care costs. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize uh, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, the gentlelady from Texas, for her five minutes of question. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for yielding. I almost don't know where to start and certainly will find the five minutes to be underwhelming in terms of the time that I need. I do want to uh, express my solemnity and humbleness and expression of appreciation for having the honor of serving on this committee, even in the midst of the horrific 9-11. It seems that this committee always rises to the occasion to be the problem solvers. And I clearly am someone who has lived the immigration story coming from Texas, and I would certainly have a different view than my friend and colleague who has just spoken about the actions that have been taken as children and families have been manipulated uh, as if they are inhuman. I do think that one of the highest callings of this committee is, in fact, to do the bidding of solving the nation's immigration problems. And as a member of the Judiciary Committee, I have over the years introduced comprehensive immigration reform legislation year after year after year. And so I am certainly willing and able to be part of the solution for the three attorney generals, of which I am a lawyer, certainly served in uh, capacities to realize the important work that you do. But I must join in the sadness of this day, uh, the sadness of this day because it is not constitutionally grounded, it is not constitutionally sound, it is not going to save any lives uh, at all, and there is nothing that you have put forward today that evidences uh, in any way uh, a impeachable offense by Secretary Mayorkas, the first immigrant to serve in this position. A dislike of the president's policy is not, is not a basis for impeachment. A basis for impeachment is corruption, abuse of power, betrayal of the nation. And that is, of course, allegations. You, as witnesses, I am sorry to say, Mr. Chairman, have borne no testimony that indicates that Secretary Mayorkas has done any of that. So I thank the ranking member for his earlier eloquent words on this shameful, fraudulent impeachment inquiry, where we are not fixing the immigration issues that my constituents in Houston need. At the onset, I'm reminded of the words of the Representative Barbara Jordan, complete difference from what I heard her quoted before. I know that she did an excellent job in trying to frame the immigration issues of years past. My predecessor represented Houston like I do. She endorsed me, glad to say a mentor. Like her, my faith in the Constitution is whole. It is complete. It is total. And I'm not going to sit here and be an idle spectator of the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. Because the Constitution said to create a more perfect union, to instill justice. That is what this inquiry is, a diminution, a subversion, and a destruction of the Constitution of the United States. I cannot stand for that. Mr. Chairman, impeachment is one of the absolute powers Congress has to ensure against an executive might, as James Madison explained at the Constitutional Convention, quote, pervert his administration into a scheme of speculation or oppression. The men present in Philadelphia some 236 years ago were deliberate. They were intentional. They were exacting in their draft of the Constitution that has guided us forever. These are their words, in the words of our Constitution, the legal standard by which we are solemnly consider 
whether to exercise its extraordinary power. Article 2, Section 4 guides, and I quote, the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for the conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanor. That is our standard. Treason, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanor. Professor Bowman, in your review of, the con of Congressman uh, Green's impeachment resolution, which referred to this committee, and in your review of the various reports by committee Republicans, have you identified any actions by Secretary Mayorkas that reached the constitutional threshold of impeachment, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors? Professor? No. In all of the reports, have you seen any evidence of such? The reports you've been able to secure or the reports that I brought your attention to? I've seen lots of reports about arguments about policy. I've seen nothing that rises to the level of an impeachable offense. And so, Mr. Chairman, the Constitution is to be our guide. We must end this political stunt that seeks to impeach an officer of the United States because an extremist minority of the House of Representatives does not agree with the policies of this president or that he carries out. Let's work with these attorney generals to solve the real problems, to not incarcerate children, to separate them from their family. Treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors is our legal standard. It is clear. That is the basis from which we must proceed. That is the constitutional bar you have failed to reach. We created this book, as they say, to create a more perfect union and to establish justice. Gentlemen, you have law degrees and have taken an oath as I have. And you've taken an oath to procure the rights of your citizens. Please sit with us to establish justice for all of America, for the work you do, and for those who come to seek a better life. However they come, we may perceive in a different light, but let us do it in perceiving justice. You hurt me, you hurt my heart, you hurt what Barbara Jordan stood for, you diminish this book and these words by sitting here today to suggest that Secretary Mayorkas must be, in fact, impeached because of policies that we disagree with. May God continue to guide us in our work so that we can do what we have been assigned to do. With that, I yield back. General Lady Yields, I now recognize Mr. Higgins, the gentleman from Louisiana and the chair of the subcommittee on, on the border. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my, my. Mr. Bowman, I wasn't even going to ask you any questions today, but uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to clarify it for record. And I do believe that, according to your resume, you're a professor of constitutional law, sir. Is that correct? I am an emeritus professor at the Missouri okay. School of Law. You're a smart guy. You got an alphabet behind your name on your business card. So is it your position that you're taking today as a Democrat's witness that the, that the founders' intent with the term high crimes and misdemeanors was designed to restrict the power of impeachment to a violation of specific written statute? Is that your position? We're listening. Yes, and, and that is your position. Okay, and no, you're excuse you're, me, excuse me, it, Congressman. You said yes. It's a simple question. No, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. The, excuse me, Congressman. It clearly was my not reclaiming is, my time. No. It clearly yes. was not the intention of the founders to limit the power of congressional impeachment over the executive branch. To, to limit that to violation of written statute. That's quite correct, Congressman. I've written extensively. Oh, well, thank you. I, but you just said you just said something different, but that's all right. We, we appreciate you being here today, Mr. Bowman, and representing uh, University of Missouri. I'm sure, it's a wonderful law school. On this committee, we've carried out our investigation with Secretary Mayorkas. I sit here today to tell you, we're going to impeach him. He's going to be impeached, and he should be. He is the executive in charge of the border policy for, for President Biden. Now, President Biden has the right, as the chief executive, to hire men that, that, that don't have the skill and then figure that out down the line and replace them. 
President Biden also has a right as a chief executive to have wild policy in mind. But, his, but the executive that sits on his cabinet, that's in charge of actually enforcing those policies, that has the law enforcement experience to know when those policies are going to bring injury upon our country, that executive has a responsibility to advise the president that his policies are not only not working to secure the border, they're actually bringing injury upon our country. The United States Constitution is, is the law of the land that we swear our oath to. Secretary Mayorkas has brought generational trauma upon our country. Hundreds of thousands of American lives destroyed. Hundreds of thousands dead. Millions and millions wave upon wave of human misery coming across our southern border. We're losing our country down there. My God, my colleagues, you've got to recognize this. We've got to stop this arterial bleed. It's not about money. We spent less money in 2019 than we did in 23, a lot less through DHS, and we had the border under control. It's policy that has changed. And who is driving that policy? Secretary Mayorkas. So who shall be impeached? Quite rightfully so. Secretary Mayorkas. Mr. Knudsen, from your position, sir, and I'm sorry for what you're, you and your people and your community and your state are going through, sir. On behalf of this Congress that has been unable to take action as of yet, I'm sorry for what you're going through. Do you concur with the things that I've spoken on and shared? I absolutely do concur, Congressman. I think this body is completely within its constitutional and legal right to bring impeachment proceedings here. Mr. Drummond. I also concur. Mr. Bailey. I concur the Secretary has abdicated his official duties. He's in dereliction of duty and should be held accountable. I appreciate all the panelists for being here today. I thank the Chairman for his leadership on this issue. He has been calm and patient and judicious in our procedure. We have laid out the case for the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. We have promised the American people we would fulfill that somber duty, and we shall. Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields. I now recognize Mr. Payne, the gentleman from New Jersey, for his five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, today's hearing would be a joke. And, and let me just put something out here with, in reference to fentanyl. It, it is something that is, is really damaging our country, our young people, obviously. But I remember in the 1980s, when the crack epidemic was prevalent, um, The First Lady, Nancy Reagan, told folks, you know, just say no. So I think we need to incorporate that into this epidemic. Why is fentanyl killing so many of our folks? Because they're consuming it. We have to look at the demand for it as well. We know we have a problem in stopping it, and we are all hell-bent in doing that. But we also have to look at the demand. Or, as Nancy Reagan said, just say no. But back to the topic at, at hand. Uh, as I stated, this would be a joke if the stakes weren't so high and serious for the reasons laid out by my friend, Ms. Jackson Lee. I'm embarrassed for my Republican colleagues 
They pretend that their fraudulent impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas is about high crimes and misdemeanors. That's because they know well, as we do, that this, is, this so-called impeachment is nothing more than an extremist MAGA takeover of the committee in this Congress. Just look at, just look at who is in um, the driver's seat of this fraudulent impeachment. It's not the chairman of the committee. It's not even the subcommittee chair. It's an extreme MAGA backbencher who proverbially speaking shoved her leadership out of the driver's seat and now has the reins of the Congress and about ready to drive us all off the cliff. The chairman can proclaim that he has led this year long investigation into Secretary Mayorkas' leadership that led to today's proceedings, but we all know that this is false. We are here because a member of Congress who believes the anti-Semitic conspiracy that Jewish space lasers coming down to Earth caused the deadly wildfires in California in 2018. Someone who has called black people like me slaves to the Democratic Party. A woman who believes serving this great country in the military is throwing your life away. Someone who supports insurrections, who tried to destroy American democracy, who wants to defund the FBI, and someone who mocked survivors of a tragic school, tragic school shooting, a member of Congress who truly all, who believes all that is brought us here. It is not Chairman Green's impeachment resolution that was referred to. This is committee, to this committee. Chairman Green has not even introduced an impeachment resolution. And it is not Chairman Green so-called investigation into Secretary Marcus that got us here. We had an impeachment resolution before us weeks before the chairman's alleged investigation even concluded. Professor Bowman, do mere policy disputes between members of Congress and a cabinet secretary constitute impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors? Congressman, they do not. I think the conclusion is universal among those who have studied this question, has been so since the, since the time of the founding, that policy differences, no matter how severe, no matter how heated, um, are simply not grounds for impeachment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to request unanimous consent to submit an article from CBS News titled, Marjorie Taylor Greene backs off forcing vote on second Alejandro Mayorkas impeachment resolution dated November 30th, 2023. Without objection, so ordered. In which Representative Green is quoted as saying, we need to do this. We need to move forward. So I got guarantees, so we will move forward with impeachment. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, uh, Mr. Bishop for his five minutes of questioning. Mr. Bowman, I, it, it strikes me that how much your opinion has changed in just a few years. I, I was it pointed out that in your 2019 book entitled High Crimes and Misdemeanors, A History of Impeachment for the Age of Trump, uh, you have this passage. No Congress since that time, referring to the impeachment of Belknap, the uh, cabinet person that, uh, tr that Grant had dismissed before his impeachment. But you say no Congress since that time has either moved fast enough or thought it worthwhile to actually impeach a subordinate executive branch official. Nevertheless, nonetheless, the latent power to do so remains important. And here's the key sentence. Not only is it useful as a signal of legislative displeasure with administration personnel and policy, but the undoubted authority of Congress to impeach subordinate officials carries with it the associated powers of the House to investigate potentially impeachable conduct and of the Senate to try the allegations and articles of impeachment. Now, frankly, sir, I agree with you more today and not then. 
Um, that is to say, I don't think pure policy differences is the basis for an impeachment. Neither is that what's happening here. It is exceedingly apt for that reason that the majority witnesses are three state attorneys general. Gentlemen, I look forward to joining you in 2025. But let me point this out. A lot of people would say, well, the American people are interested in hearing something about a legal case. I think they might be. Last June, two of your colleagues in Texas and in Louisiana had sued Secretary Mayorkas, saying that guidelines that he issued to his department blatantly violated commands of Congress in statute to detain any criminal who had committed certain crimes and was, and was released from state custody were required, the Attorney General then, the Secretary of Homeland Security later by amendment, required to detain such persons until they were deported. And persons subject to a permanent order, a final order of deportation, required to be detained. Contrary to that order, Secretary Mayorkas dismantled the detainer process completely. He said, he said that that was going to be subject to discretion. Only in cases where the department or he deems it to in, imperil our national security or security from additional crime would it be done. Attorneys General sued, and here's what the Supreme Court said. You don't have standing. We can't hear from you. We can't settle this. Here's what Alito said in dissent. The Congress, to put the point simply, Congress enacted a law that requires the apprehension and detention of certain illegal aliens whose release it thought would endanger public safety. The Secretary of DHS does not agree with that categorical requirement. He prefers a more flexible policy. And the court's answer today is that the executive's policy choice prevails unless Congress, by withholding funds, refusing to confirm presidential nominees, threatening impeachment and removal, et cetera, can win a test of strength. In other words, the Alito in defense went on and said, I don't think this is a wise decision for us to make, but that is the decision the majority made. That if you want the law to be followed, you're going to have to impeach somebody. You're going to have to, as Justice Alito said, the Congress is going to have to go to war with the executive. Mr. Knudsen, what about that? Isn't that right? Isn't that what the Congress is put to, to decide whether to do our duty? As the Supreme Court has said, we can't do it. It's up to the Congress. And you guys have, been, have tried to do it. You've succeeded in other areas. You're continuing to sue, and you're succeeding. Florida has enjoined some practices. I think the Supreme Court just granted an emergency uh, relief from the DHS cutting Texas border barrier. What about that, Mr. Knudsen? I didn't leave you a lot of time, but I'm sure you can add more wisdom in 30 seconds than I did into it. I'll be brief, Congressman. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I absolutely agree, not only with uh, Justice Alito's dissent, but I, the, I would point out also in that case that the majority also pointed out, uh, to your point, that Congress possesses an array of tools to analyze and influence those policies, and those are political checks for the political process. That's exactly what you're dealing with here. You folks have got an executive versus legislative branch war here. So much of this, Mr. Chairman, isn't about even policy discretion that's granted to the administration. It is about square violations of law. And they will either be, they cannot be re remedied in court, they will either be de dealt with by this Congress to vindicate the rule of law, or we will surrender rule of law to a rule of man. I yield. The gentleman yields. I now recognize Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Point of order. Point of order. The point of order, you're recognized. Uh, I think we all heard the colleague say he's running for another office. Uh, but that violates the rule 23. Uh, and, and I won't ask that it be taken down. I just ask that if he's going to run, just go run. Just don't run when the committee is in session. The gentleman uh, has, has made his point of order, and I now recognize Mr. Swalwell, the gentleman from California, and our ranking member on Cybersecurity Subcommittee for his five minutes of questioning. I want to thank the attorneys general uh, for participating 
uh, today. Thank you for your service to your states. I was a prosecutor before coming to Congress. I missed that job. Uh, my father was a cop. My brothers are cops. And it seems like we've got a pretty educated group of attorneys general here. Mr. Knudsen, uh, you went to Montana Law School, right? Yes, Representative. Great. Pretty good law school. Uh, Mr. Bailey, uh, University of Missouri, is that right? Yes. And you served our country after September 11 as well. Yes. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Mr. Drummond, uh, you went to Georgetown, is that right? I did. That's a good school. I was rejected there twice uh, for law school and then as a transfer. Uh, that's a very good school. Um, I just want to level set where we all are on what's a crime, what's not a crime, because uh, the three of you have offered testimony to my Republican colleagues about uh, what is an impeachable offense? Uh, and I, I just want to go down the list here of some of the potential impeachable offenses uh, that we've seen in, in the history of the Congress. Uh, bribery, Mr. Knudsen, would you agree that's an impeachable offense? I would, Congressman. Mr. Drummond, would you agree bribery is an impeachable offense? I would. And uh, Mr. Bailey, would you agree bribery is an impeachable offense? Yes. Same as extortion, Mr. Knudsen? Yes. Mr. Drummond, extortion? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. How about obstruction of justice? Would you agree that that's an impeachable offense, Mr. Knudsen? Uh, if there was a conviction, yes. Okay. Mr. Drummond? Yes. And Mr. Bailey? Yes. How about inciting violence against police officers? Uh, what would you say, Mr. Knudsen? Again, if there was a, a conviction of a criminal offense, I think that would certainly rise to the level. And Mr. Drummond, how about incitement of violence? Yes. And Mr. Bailey? incitement of violence. We would need more facts to make that legal determination. I think that's a bereft of sufficient facts. And, and Mr. Knudsen, I just want to drill down a little bit because you said if there was a conviction. Um, so are you saying that Mr. Mayorka should be convicted criminally before he could be impeached? Congressman, no. I'm simply speaking to your example of would inciting violence against a police officer rise to the level of an impeachable offense. I, my testimony was if there was a conviction for that crime, then yes. Okay. And, and obstruction of justice, you said the same thing, right? Correct. But you think for Mr. Mayorkas, he does not need a conviction to be impeached? Well, as this body has done in its past, I think there's certainly precedent. No, I do not believe there has to be a criminal offense. High crimes and misdemeanors, as it was understood by the founders, as it was understood in the English common law, does not necessarily mean there has to be an actual crime committed. In the summer of 2019, former President Donald Trump used $300 million of taxpayer dollars to ask President Zelensky of Ukraine to get dirt on his potential uh, primary political opponent, uh, Joe Biden, uh, and he was uh, impeached in the House uh, for that. Should he have been impeached for that, Mr. Knudsen? Mr. Chairman, I'm, or excuse me, Mr. Chairman, Re Representative, I'm not a member of this Congress. I'm not privy to all that information. I, I certainly haven't seen a lot of those reports. Uh, this body chose to go forward with those proceedings as is its purview. Mr. Drummond? It's outside my lane. I'm okay. just a simple attorney general from Oklahoma. Mr. Bailey? I believe President Trump was acquitted of all charges, and that's beyond the, the purview of my testimony today. On January 6, he incited and aimed a violent mob at the Capitol. Uh, six police officers would later lose their lives. Uh, one lost a finger, one lost an eye. The president was uh, impeached. Ten Republicans voted for that impeachment. Uh, Mr. Knudsen, should he have been impeached for that, yes or no? Mr. Chairman, Representative, he, he was. Okay. Mr. Drummond? He, he was impeached for that. And should he have been? I, I don't have an opinion on that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bailey, what do you think about that? He was acquitted of those charges. Okay. So what's interesting to me, and again, I respect that you all are here, is that when you've testified to Mr. Mayorkas' conduct, and you believe pretty clearly that he can be impeached for his conduct, but when we go through pretty egregious conduct of using taxpayer dollars, of inciting and aiming a mob, having the greatest attack ever on this Congress, this Capitol, our Constitution. You don't want to comment on it at all. And I think what we're really seeing from the majority in all of this is that they're not interested in finding any solution on the border. In fact, what we have seen is that there's a 2014 deal in the Senate, bipartisan. They walked away when they were in the majority. Speaker Johnson has said that he will refuse any additional funding for the border. And, and now we have witnesses who, again, want to comment only on Mayorkas, but don't want to comment on President Trump. Mr. Chairman, respectfully, I just see a party that wants 
that does not want to fix but only wants the fiction. Uh, and with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I was fascinated by my, my colleagues, um, you know, uh, questioning, line of questioning. Um, somewhere I was going to go to, uh, maybe not as quite as eloquently as him. I'm not uh, running for attorney general or anything. Um, Mr. Bowman, um, you say in your testimony, written testimony, and some the foundational requirements for impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors is that they must be extraordinarily seriousness and, and ought to be of the type that corrupts or subverts governmental processes or the constitutional order. And I find that, you know, I, 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 I underline that specifically because I wanted to ask you, do you believe that the, that the death of 200,000 Americans from fentanyl overdoses, is that, is that extraordinarily serious? It's certainly an, an, a serious matter and one that has to be addressed by this body by exercising its constitutional legislative powers to work with the, leg with the executive branch um, to address the policy. The problem that you have that you're confronting here uh, that's, 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 good. that's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reclaim my time now that you've answered the question. Thank you very much. Okay. And then, and, and that ought to be of the type that corrupts or subverts governmental processes or the constitutional order. Now, you know, I'm not a, con you know, I'm not a constitutional scholar, et cetera, but I do believe that the, the, the Constitution is set up to have three distinct branches of government. You have legislative, you have judicial, and then you have the administrative branch. And, and the Founding Fathers wanted a balance of power. Is that, is that what you get from the, from the Constitution and the Founding Fathers, what they wanted to do? The balance of power? Mr. Bowman? Indeed. Okay. And so the, it, it's up to the legislative branch to actually create the laws. And the will of Congress is supposed to be then carried out by the administrative branch. Is, am I off on that, or is that what the Founding Fathers thought should have happened? In general, yes. Okay. And so we have this issue of policy versus law. And, and if I read, if I get you right, you believe that this is a question of policy, but I don't believe it's a question of policy. I believe it's actually a question of violating the law. The law clearly states that people coming into the United States or, or people seeking asylum in the United States, two things happen to them. They're either detained by, here in, in country or they're, they're detained in another country waiting the outcome of their, of their asylum hearing. That's what the law says. Um, the law also says that the, the executive branch actually has the right to parole, but on a case-by-case -case basis, not mass, mass, mass uh, parole. And so the... The Mayorkas administration, the Biden Mayorkas administration, is actually violating both. They're they're not detaining people coming in, either, or they're they're not keeping them in a third country, and they're not detaining the United States, and they're also allowing mass my, mass parole, which violates the clear intent of Congress. Is it your opinion that the only that that this is a policy issue, and that the the uh, the Biden administration has the right to clearly subvert the will of Congress? My opinion, Congressman, is that disputes over the exercise of discretion by the Secretary um, are difficult. They're being resolved in the courts. Um, I'm, and I must say that those disputes have not yet been finalized. Indeed, the only cases involving those disputes that have made it up the Supreme Court uh, have resulted in rulings uh, in, in favor of the Secretary and of the President. Uh, essentially, this is an ongoing legal and policy dispute. Um, it, is, it is not, therefore, the kind of thing for which uh, impeachment should be used. Well, I, I believe that, you know, that we are at a crossroads here because I do believe that uh, we, Congress, have given way too much leeway to, to the administrative branch, if that's the case. This is clearly the intent of, of, of Congress was... Uh, People coming to the border need to either stay in, a, in, a, in another country or they need to be detained. And it clearly was that parole was to be do, done on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, I don't believe that there's an issue of policy. It's an issue of violating the law. And that violation of the law has actually caused, has actually led to mass suffering in the United States, 
uh, 200,000 Americans dying because of fentanyl overdose. And I disagree with my, with my colleague on the other side that says it's a question of, of voluntarily stopping using drugs. Actually, mo a lot of these deaths are caused by people that don't even know they're taking fentanyl. They're thinking they're taking something else. Uh, and it's laced with fentanyl. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, it's, if, it's, if we're down to that, where every single time that there is a, that, that the administration decides to violate the law, that we have to impeach somebody, I guess then we, we need to impeach somebody. And so with that, uh, you know, I yield my time back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I kind of agree with Mr. Godinez and some of the comments he made. Uh, before I get into my uh, presentation, I'd like to present a uh, article submitted for the record titled 20 through 2023 year in review secretary mayorkas champions department wide efforts to save lives and prepare for the 21st century security challenges without objection so moved and i want to thank our witnesses for being here today i'm glad you're here talking about those things that are important you spoke passionately about fentanyl the damage that's caused to our communities I'm with you on that one. Back home on Main Street, a lot of deaths, a lot of pain because of fentanyl. My investigation of this issue, 90% of fentanyl, more like 95%, comes through our ports of entry. And 65% comes through one port of entry, the San Ysidro port of entry. And most of that, the majority, vast majority, is smuggled by American citizens and green card holders. That's why I support additional funding for our ports of entry. Technology, more personnel, more drug sniffing dogs, more technology. And Mr. Chair, again, I wanna thank you for holding this hearing because Homeland Security is an important issue for all Americans, for this nation. So let's look at the facts here today. Let's be clear about what we're looking at today on a worldwide basis. Some of the nations that are dealing with this, what I would call worldwide refugee challenge, United States, Europe, Germany, Italy, Greece, Colombia. Colombia's holding three million Venezuelan refugees right now. Costa Rica, Mexico. These are among some of the nations looking at this refugee challenge. Let's go. Let's look at some of the causes of this migratory pattern. COVID-19 and Secretary Mayorkas did not bring up COVID-19. COVID, you know, Secretary Mayorkas is also not responsible for the robberies, gang violence, extortions in Central America. And Secretary Mayorkas is also not responsible for the government collapse and violence in Haiti He's also not responsible for the challenges, the economic collapse in Venezuela. Secretary Mayorkas is also not responsible for the human rights violations, economic collapse in Cuba. He's also not responsible for the economic collapse, human rights violations in Nicaragua, Peru, Ecuador, the invasion of Russia, of Ukraine, the economic collapse going on in China today. Secretary Mayorkas is not responsible for these things. To the contrary, he's working to manage the challenge and provide frontline officers with the resources that they need. Even Senate Republicans get it. Senate Republicans are working with Democrats right now and the White House to try to address these challenges. In the last minute and a half that I have, I'm going to ask Professor Bowman, is Secretary Mayorkas executing the law to the full extent of his abilities? The Republicans are working with Democrats right now and the White House to try to address these challenges. So in the last minute and a half that I have, I'm going to ask Professor Bowman, is Secretary Mayorkas executing the law to the full extent of his abilities? with the limited resources Congress has given him. Is this an impeachable offense, sir? No, sir, it is not. Uh, and I should point out also in addition, it's critical to note that if we could impeach cabinet officers 
or presidents for that matter, anytime there are legal disputes about the application of the law or their exercise of discretion, then every president and every cabinet officer would be impeachable. In the previous administration, that of Mr. Trump, there were repeated lawsuits against Mr. Trump's immigration policy, um, some of which he won, some of which he lost. If the mere presence of heated legal disagreements about the legitimacy of presidential immigration policy were impeach impeachable, Mr. Trump would have been impeached for a third time. To do such a thing would be profoundly anti-constitutional and profound, profound disruption of the constitutional separation of powers. So, sir, are we looking essentially at political public policy debate here as opposed to an impeachable offense? That's certainly my interpretation, Congressman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. You. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent motion here. Do you want to do it now or wait to your turn? I'll do it now if I could. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to introduce January 10th, um, 2024, Washington Post article where the chairman is quoted as saying that our investigation made clear that this crisis finds its foundation in Secretary Mayorkas's decision making. And Congressman Norman talks about needing to impeach Mayorkas because okay. of, quote, bad judgment. Okay. Uh, with no. Um Disconsent or disagreement, we'll admit it to the record. Now, I recognize Mr. Pfluger, the gentleman from Texas, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's sad that we're here. Sad that we're in this position. Earlier, um, it was said that this is not a legitimate impeachment. I, I guess that's something Democrats know a little bit about. Uh, and our witness just talked about um, the impeachment of Mr. Trump. So. I disagree with that, and I really I take no pleasure in the significance of this effort. I've wrestled with the appropriate constitutional response to what has become a complete failure to enforce the law, to adhere to congressional directives, to secure the homeland. The, and the failure to secure the homeland has been so significant, so catastrophic, that Congress must use its power to provide accountability. We must be the check and the balance against such an extremely egregious breach of public trust. And that's what this is. And if not this effort, then I ask my Democrat colleagues, what effort? Where is your answer to accountability? Where is your Article I authorities to check the, the executive branch? Will the gentleman yield to answer the question? No, the answer from the other side simply cannot be that we're powerless. And I ask rhetorically, if not this effort, then how do we hold this failure? And you'll have your chance to, to wax poetic on that. Let's just go through the numbers. Fiscal 23, 27,000 pounds of fentanyl was seized. That's, that's what was seized. That's not all that entered this country. Mr. Chairman, the Speaker of the House has put together a document, and it goes step by step for the actions the administration has taken since January 20th of 2021. President Biden terminated the national emergency at the Southwest border. President Biden issued an executive order further entrenching DACA program. Biden unveiled the U.S. Citizenship Act, which would provide amnesty. The administration issued an executive order ending limitations and restrictions on immigration without certain countries associated with terrorism. Then Secretary Mayorkas delivered remarks effectively explaining the border is open for illegal immigration by stating that DHS's focus would be on processing. On and on and on. Mayorkas issued a memorandum prohibiting enforcement of immigration laws in certain areas, including schools, healthcare, and facilities. Mayorkas terminated migrant protection protocols. Mayorkas issued a memorandum that states the fact that an individual, that an individual is removable alien should not be the sole basis of an enforcement action. I want to enter this with the unanimous consent into the uh, record, Mr. Chairman. I'd like uh, to seek unanimous consent. So ordered. So what, what, sorry, what is the document? As I mentioned, the document is from the Speaker of the House, a list of actions. If we can pause the time, please, because this is administrative. This is a list of actions that the administration has taken step by step since January 20th of 2021. And it goes in order chronologically of the actions that the administration has taken that have weakened us, including those that Secretary it, Mayorkas has taken. But it's created by the- The gentleman is not office. recognized right now, okay? Uh, and well, it then is I his object. time. I object it's to his the, time. Okay, you no, no, object. He's trying to well, enter well, it. That's why I'm asking. I'm, okay. I'm, 
He's, okay. I object to the entry of this document. That so you was dissent. Created. Okay. Uh, All right. That's that's. We'll uh, vote on it, I suppose. Then, then okay. Are you asking for a vote? Unanimous consent was just disagreed to. Are we going to vote on this? Yes. Okay. All right. We need to clear the witnesses, get the clerks in here, and we'll vote on it. Stop the clock also. That's not. That's Sam. That's Sam. Okay. Okay. It's just, okay. Uh, my apologies. It's just objected to, and there is there is no vote. So my, my misunderstanding. Thank you. I'm assuming yeah. that's what you were right. declaring. Right. Thank you, ranking member. Uh, the gentleman is recognized. Okay, and I, I think and we, I'll make up the time. Two, two minutes and 15 seconds or two minutes and 20 seconds. When You're, uh, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank um, you. Earlier this year, Director Ray sat here with Secretary Mayorkas and told us, told this committee that there were still known and suspected terrorists at large in the United States that we knew had matched the terror watch list that came into this country illegally and that we didn't know where they were. And right next to him sat Secretary Mayorkas, and I said, what is the policy of DHS when you know that somebody matches the terror watch list? This is the reason we're having this hearing, because he could not explain to this committee that DHS actually has a policy to detain those people. He couldn't explain his policy. That's why we're here, because there are people on the terror watch list. Mr. Drummond, or Attorney General Drummond, can you tell us the extent of the damages that are being done in Oklahoma as a result of the illegal immigration, the 8 million people who have entered this country illegally. We shut down an illegal grow every day in the state of Oklahoma, where we detain and arrest upwards of dozens of people. They're refilled the next day with those who cross the border from either in a Mexican cartel or a Chinese syndicated crime organization. It is ceaseless. Do you believe that the Department of Homeland Security under the leadership of Secretary Mayorkas is upholding the laws that we currently have on the books to stop, the, to stop illegal immigration into this country. I think that there is a failure to enforce the laws on parole, removal requirements, detention, and the like. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it was earlier said that we Republicans are going to the border in polo shirts and khaki pants or something to that effect. Well, at least we're going to the border and at least we're asking the questions because when you talk to the Border Patrol agents, they will tell you that there are no consequences. The consequences do not exist. Deportation doesn't exist. The catch and release policies are allowing people to flood into my community of San Angelo, Texas, Midland and Odessa. And the fentanyl deaths alone that have been catastrophic to this country, over 100,000 people, should be the sole reason that this committee comes together I hope that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, when given your time, will examine the facts. The facts are that over 8 million people have come into this country illegally. The facts are that the Secretary of Homeland Security has not secured our country against terrorism, against fentanyl, against criminal gangs, against traffickers, against sex slavery, against any of it. He is complicit. In fact, he is willfully complicit, which is why he needs to be impeached. I yield back. Gentlemen yields, I now recognize Mr. Thanadar, the gentleman from Michigan, for his five minutes of question. Thank you, Chairman Green, uh, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Professor Bowman, uh, would you say that Secretary America's done anything that rise to the level of high crime and misdemeanor? No, Congressman. Now, we know uh, our immigration system is broken for decades. There is not much work done to reform our immigration system. And Secretary Mayorkas should not bear the blame for the inherent flaws within the system he has inherited. And my appeal uh, to my Republican colleagues here is that rather than getting bogged down in an impeachment process that seems needless and devoid of constitutional authority, let's fix, shift our focus working together in fixing our broken immigration system. Our broken immigration system is causing our nation a 
loss of billions and trillion dollars in economic growth. I, uh, when I was 24 years old, um, living in India, having gotten uh, admission into a PhD program here, and I made many trips to the American embassy in Mumbai to get a student visa. And uh, the embassy kept denying me my student visa. They denied my student visa for four times. And only on the fifth time I got my visa approved because the counselor who was who had denied my visa for the four times had gone to America for her vacation. I mean, there is no doubt uh, the system is broken. We are losing. Businesses keep telling me that they can't find a qualified, uh, skilled workforce that they need to grow the businesses. Australia and uh, Canada has taken advantage of our broken immigration system to attract uh, highly skilled workers that our businesses need to grow and stay on top of innovation. We, we know uh, immigrants are 60% less likely to be incarcerated than uh, their native counterparts. I just want to take this time to appeal um, across the aisle to let us spend our energies and our constitutional authority to solve the problems, to fix the broken immigration system that we have not uh, dealt with for decades. And uh, let's not blame the secretary for our broken immigration system, but let's fix it to help our economy uh, create jobs and make things better for all. Thank you. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to witnesses for being here today. You know, I, I've heard a lot of the statements coming from my colleagues and they're acting like we're, we've come here on a whim. We're not here on a whim. This is, you know, we haven't come here lightly, this hearing today. The, there have been problems at the borders, at the border for years. And now uh, every state in the nation, every state in the nation is seeing those effects negatively. Uh, I just look at my own state in New York and, and, and the costs and, uh, of dealing with the, the crisis at the border. And we have been begging the administration to do something for years. Nothing has been done. We're not, we're not here on a whim. Something has to be done. So that's why we are here where we are. If leadership can't follow the laws of the land, follow the laws of the land. It's not just policy. There's laws. There are, written, there are laws on the books. And they are being ignored right now by the current administration and the current secretary. If they can't follow the laws that are on the books, we need to find someone who will. So I think, I think we have uh, taken the time and necessary steps to arrive here in a proper manner. It's taken a while. And our country has been at disservice before, because of that, it's taken so long. Uh, but we're here today, and uh, I appreciate you all being here. And um, I'm gonna start with Mr. Attorney General uh, Drummond. You've described Oklahoma's challenge with the explosion of unlicensed and illicit drug manufacturing in the state following Senate, the Secretary Moyark is becoming a leader of Homeland Security. Can you describe more about the challenges of Oklahoma law enforcement that Oklahoma law enforcement faces in confronting this illegal activity, especially for rural police and sheriff's departments who have limited resources? Let me give you a tangible example, Representative. Uh, one recent drug bust at an illegal grow operation, our agents were processing those who were committed felonies and detained and those that were simply being trafficked in labor and sex. 
And one of those was identified as a, a individual on an HSI detainer for illegal entry. He was supposed to be in Flushing, New York. He was supposed to have on an ankle monitor. When we contacted the field representative in HSI, they said, you know, charge him with a felony, we'll come pick him up. But he in fact had not committed a felony. Then we were instructed to say, please direct him to turn himself in to the nearest HSI field office. And so we did that and let him go. That happens day in and day out across Oklahoma where we don't have the resources afforded to detain those that we know are illegally in the state committing crimes or complicit in the com committing of crimes. You would like to, in New York, we have laws that actually direct that they automatically be released. And we see crime after crime after crime be committed by the same person. And, we, and in New York, you, big state like New York, you think we'd have uh, uh, have the ability, we do have the ability to keep people in, in, in prison and stop the crimes from happening. Our laws direct us not to, but at least in, in Oklahoma, you would, uh, you would like to be able to, to, to make sure that these criminals are not released back now out. Now New York has one fewer. We yeah. haven't. Good. Um, another crisis, Mr. Attorney General, uh, that has resulted from the unprecedented chaos at the southwest southern border is the explosion of fentanyl poisonings in this country. We have seen many, far too many, in New York. From 2018 to 2022, Oklahoma experienced a 735% increase in fentanyl deaths, according to the Oklahoma Bureau, Bureau of Narcotics. Oklahoma has a unique status sitting just north of the Texas and right along major routes, routes away from the southwest border for both drug and human smuggling. Can you talk about how the fentanyl crisis over the past few years has impacted your state? So we, uh, with, with the legalization of marijuana in Oklahoma, it's not become the drug of cho choice to cross the border. Uh, fentanyl is now the drug of choice. And I take exception with the representative who said it is just to say no. It, it is a crisis in which we find fentanyl laced in many drugs, such that we instruct our young children to test every pill. Don't, if you think you're taking a pain pill, it's probably laced with fentanyl. And we can trace those back to uh, the porous border through which the fentanyl product comes in concert with the Mexican cartels and the Chinese syndicated organizations. This is for any of the attorney generals. Um, have you, we get a lot of uh, unaccompanied alien children in, in New York. Have you witnessed in your state these children being used for purposes of sex trafficking or other forms of exploitation? Anyone can jump in and grab it. I, I will jump in quickly with an example. We uh, busted uh, a grow in Northwest Oklahoma City and in which uh, there were two minor young women from China uh, that were being sex trafficked. And we have intercepted communication in mainland China where they're effectively posting jobs to come to Oklahoma, uh, quote, uh, as massage spa, quote, able to endure hardships, quote, good hygiene. And yet these young women are being exploited and we don't have a remedy to take care of them. And quickly, I know. Missouri now ranks fourth on the list of the states with the highest rates of human trafficking. Uh, in 2021, there were 1,100 reported cases, detected cases of human trafficking in the state of Missouri. 327 victims identified. Congressman, human trafficking has increased in my state multiple hundred percent since 2019. I think that answers your question. Yield back. Gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Magazine. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I, I've been listening to all of my Republican colleagues throughout this hearing, and I'm still struggling to understand what high crime they believe the secretary has committed. I've heard that he hasn't achieved operational control defined as not a single person crossing the border uh, illegally. No administration has met that standard. I've heard them say that he has failed to detain everyone who is undocumented, who has come across the border. No administration has. Uh, under the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas uh, has removed three million undocumented people from this country. So when I hear my colleagues say that deportation does not exist, I can think of three million people who would disagree with that. He has continued construction of a border wall that many of us question the effectiveness of. And when the secretary and the president were asked, do you think that the wall works? They say, no, we don't think it works, but we're building it because the law requires us to do it. They're following the law. 
We face difficult challenges at the southern border. There is no question. Instability in other countries has driven people to come to the United States, and it has created a chaotic situation. But unfortunately, rather than working with us and the president and the secretary to address these challenges, too many of my Republican colleagues are focused more on partisan grandstanding and campaigning, including this impeachment theater. So here's the real truth. President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas have taken steps to try to secure the borders, but House Republicans have tried to obstruct them every step of the way because they want a campaign issue more than they want to fix the problem. Here are the facts. In 2022, Democrats passed and the president signed $86 billion for enhanced border security, more personnel, more funding for ICE, additional technology. 200 House Republicans voted against that funding, including every single Republican member of this committee who was in office at the time. This year, in 2023, House Republicans passed their so-called Limit Save Grow Act, which would have cut the Department of Homeland Security budget by 22%, eliminating 2,400 CBP officers. Every Republican member of the House voted for that bill, a 22% cut. The Republican Limit Save Grow Act, I guess, is to limit border patrol and grow chaos. This year, this past year, President Biden requested $84 million in his budget to help states and cities with the costs associated with incoming migrants. House Republicans proposed cutting that funding to zero. So to the state officials who are here, who are coming from states that are having challenges with the migrant crisis, I've got bad news for you. Our Republican colleagues are trying to zero out the line item in the budget to help states and cities. I'm a former state treasurer myself, and that is deeply, deeply distressing. And of course, most recently, in October, President Biden requested $14 billion in supplemental funding for border enforcement. That would add 1,300 Border Patrol agents, 1,000 CBP officers. But House Republicans have not called a vote on this funding. And they'll say, well, there's other things in it that we don't like. You know, there's a growing pro-Putin wing in the House Republican caucus that doesn't like Ukraine funding. They don't want more asylum judges, even though that's part of how we solve the problem at the border. Fine, call a vote on the parts that you do like. The CBP agents, Border Patrol. You've been sitting on it for three months. If you really, truly cared about solving the problem, you would call a vote. Instead, they've been sitting on it for three months, then went on vacation for a month while Secretary Mayorkas was meeting with Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats to try to come up with a border plan. And House Republicans were MIA. And I know what my colleagues are going to say. They're going to say, well, we did HR2. We are trying to do something. Don't forget what's in HR2. All right, HR2 would require nonprofit organizations to verify the citizenship of the people they were serving, or else they would risk losing their federal funding. It would request coffee shops all across the country, small businesses, to do citizen checks, citizenship checks of their employees. Zero out the funding for legal assistance for minors so that once again we'd have five year olds going into court and standing in front of judges with no lawyers. And we tried to negotiate with them, we tried to put in amendments to make that bill better. But of course, they wouldn't work with us. So let's not forget what's really going on here. The secretary is trying to do his job. House Republicans have been obstructing him every step of the way and are now trying to impeach him because this is about politics for many of them. It is not about solving the problem at the border, which is what we should be doing. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. Green, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to bring up that nothing spells impeachment theater unlike the, uh, or, you know, the last impeachment of our former president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. That was quite a political uh, sham impeachment. But today we're talking about a real impeachment that needs to take place. There have been over 20 occasions that Secretary Mayorkas has claimed that the border is either closed or secure, starting even back in 2021, when he is on record stating the border is secure. The border is closed. Again, the border is closed. The border is secure. He stated to Fox News, Peter Ducey, the border 
is closed. Then he stated again uh, to Congressman Fluger here on this committee. Congressman Fluger asked him, said the border is secure. We are, we are executing our plan, as he stated to Congressman Fluger. Secretary America said, I have been very clear and unequivocal in that regard. Congressman, the border is no less secure than it was previously. He also uh, stated to Congressman Michael Guest on our committee when he was asked by Congressman Guest, do you maintain today in light of the statements made by Chief Ortiz that the border is secure? Secretary Mayorkas replied, Congressman, I stand by my prior assessment because indeed I define it as maximizing the resources we have to deliver the most effective results. His results have been quite effective. Here are some of Secretary Mayorkas's effective results. Approximately 10 million illegal border crossers from over 160 countries have invaded the United States since President Biden took office and Secretary Mayorkas started his job. This is uh, a number com combined with over 8 million encounters and over 1.8 million gotaways. In September 2023, over 341,000 illegal border crossers invaded our country, surpassing all national records. Secretary Mayorkas is bringing the results. In fiscal year 2023, there were over 3 million illegals who invaded the border, the highest number of yearly illegal alien encounters in U.S. history. That far surpasses uh, those that were supposedly deported. There have been approxi approximately 73,000 special interest aliens arrested at our border. Those are the ones that we know of, ladies and gentlemen. There's over 1.8 million gotaways, and we have no idea how many in that 1.8 million or more are terrorists, are from terrorist nations. We don't know where they are, what they're doing, and what their plans are for the United States of America, including the states that you're working very hard to protect. These are some, some impressive results. Most impressive for American taxpayers is the total federal expenditures, and this is this is just in 2023, stands at 66,449,136,000. But let's talk about total state and local expenditures. Stands at 115,608,730,000. The total national expenditures for border crossers for 2023 stands at $182,057,865,000. That is an unbelievable expense for the American people and the American taxpayers. And what are the results from Secretary Mayorkas's job performance? He's violated the Secure Fence Act of 2006 by not maintaining operational control of our border. He's violated the Immigration and Nationality Act he has violated the INI by implementing catch and release policies when federal law specifically mandates the detention and removable of inadmissible aliens. He's violated the INI. He's violated the guarantee clause set forth in Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, which requires the federal government to protect states against invasion. And I'd like to just finish with asking each one of you... Um, in your position and your experience and the problems that each of you were dealing with, do you believe that Secretary Mayorkas's actions and refusal to enforce the laws warrant impeachment? Absolutely, Congresswoman. He has failed to perform and is culpably inefficient, yes. The Secretary is acting in violation of the law and constitutional order. Thank you very much. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize Ms. Ramirez. Uh, from Illinois for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman. <sighs> after a year in this room, after more than 15 hearings and approximately 45 hours of talking and talking and talking about the border, we come back to committee not to address 30 years of failed border policy and political inaction that's created a humanitarian crisis in our borders, but to pursue a baseless impeachment. 
Today marks the 16th wasted hearing on the border. Mr. Bowman, give me a yes or no. Based on your knowledge and expertise on impeachments, do you agree that historically impeachments have been an important tool to ensure accountability in our democratic institutions? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. And Mr. Bowman, if you could be concise with just one sentence, are you aware of any federal offense Secretary Mayorkas has committed that could amount to an impeachable offense? No. Thank you. And for the record, because I think you've had to answer this a couple of times, yes or no, in your expert opinion, is there a legitimate basis for this impeachment? No. And in your opinion, in today's hearing, is this an effective use of committee resources, yes or no? I don't know that's a question I'm an expert in answering. I think that's a question for the committee. Well, let me answer that. I believe it is not the right use of our time here because I think that we should be here identifying ways to address solutions. So this impeachment proceedings demonstrate that some of my Republicans, seriously, they're willing to take impeachment an important tool for accountability and make a mockery of it for political gain. This is how I know that they're not taking the humanitarian crisis within our borders seriously, because impeachment will not make our borders any safer for our communities or for asylum seekers. And it will not address the conditions across Latin America that motivate families to migrate across jungles and deserts to our southern border. So, if they were serious, they would be taking up any of the topics on this list of 16, six of us Congress people to advance, including today, we've wasted 16 hearings on political theater that could have been better served considering policies on 16 actions right here behind me. Let me read them for the record. We could be expanding work permits. We could be increasing border personnel to expand assistance to our new arrivals. We could be modernizing legal pathways to citizenship. We can be granting immigration parole instead of fighting it. We could be addressing and preparing for climate migration. We could be investing in economic development of Latin American communities. We can end the Monroe Doctrine. We can allocate resettlement funding for displaced populations. We can lift and reform time-based immigration bars. We can modernize definitions, standards in our antiquated system. We can establish humanitarian standards. We can improve upon adjudicatory processing capacity. We can increase personnel to reduce USCIS backlogs. We can implement federal coordination of resettlement to interior cities. Let me take a breath. Now let me go to the 15th. We can strengthen democracy and combat corruption in Latin America. We can pass HR 16, the American Dream and Promise Act. And because fentanyl is, in fact, an issue in this country, let me add a 17th one. Since if we wanted to work, we can actually get things done. We could actually fund technological resources to prevent fentanyl from being smuggled through our ports of entry by US Americans. So let me say to you, as a proud daughter of immigrants, the wife of a dreamer, and the representative of Illinois 3, I'm here to get things done. We have to get serious about addressing every policy opportunity listed behind me today. We could start by expediting work permits because let's just be honest. To me, Congress, this institution, this chamber represents a sacred responsibility to come together to realize the solutions and problems impacting our constituents. And let me tell you the persecution of immigrants and Secretary Mayorkas is not going to change the price of milk in your district. It's not going to address the shrinking tax base in your district. And it's not going to fill the vacant positions of industries in your local businesses. Action will. Action will address the historic labor shortage. It will increase our revenue through taxes. It will reduce supply and distribution chain challenges. And it will grow our GDP by $1.7 trillion over the next decade. So if we are serious to have to address this border issue, then let's actually get to do the work that addresses border policy. Because policy in action speaks louder than the 16 hearings and the 48 hours of talk and talk and sound bites and photo ops at the border. I have been to the border. My mother crossed it. I was there with her. I am serious about the work we can do here. Are you? Thank you, Chairman. And with that, I yield back.
The gentlelady yields. I now recognize the uh, vice chair of the committee, uh, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Guest, for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I begin my question, I have something I'd like to submit for the record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a post uh, from January 15, 2019, titled The Case for Impeachment of Donald Trump, Part 3, uh, written by Mr. Bowman, one of our witnesses today, in which he takes uh, a very highly uh, a, a view of impeachment uh, in which he says that then-President Donald Trump could be impeached over foreign policy differences. Uh, and I quote from that article, it said, surely we can impeach a president for needless shattering a basket of good treaties and entire intricate web of foreign relations they support. Consider Mr. Trump's rolling destruction of America's foreign policy. And goes on to say there's powerful evidence that the framers uh, included conducts and damaging to the U.S. policy, a category of impeachable behavior. Uh, I think that that contradicts the testimony that we've heard here today, uh, Mr. Chairman, from Mr. Bowman. Uh, and so I would like to submit uh, this article uh, for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. To our witnesses, thank you for being here uh, today. Uh, we see the numbers on the southwest border continue to grow exponentially each and every day. Uh, as our attorney generals know, you are more aware of these numbers uh, than we are because you deal with the after effects. Those 300,000 that came across the border just last month, many of those will end up in your communities. Your testimonies, as I've read them, says that your communities, your states, your cities, that you'll be responsible for housing, for feeding, for educating, for health care. You talk about the strain that this is going to be placing on the criminal justice system. And then you also talk about the total lack of response from our federal government. And so first I want to apologize to you uh, that you are not getting the help that you need from the federal government. And the help that you need is not us sending you money after these immigrants have come into your community the help that you need is us stopping the immigrants from coming across the border. What we saw is we need policies similar to what we saw under the previous administration where we were able to stop immigrants from coming across the border. The last two witnesses on the other side try to place blame on this on the Republican Party, that we need to be doing more. And I know that our attorney generals know, and I hope those watching on television know, that this Republican Party has done our part. We have passed H.R. 2, the most comprehensive immigration package that has been made through the, 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 at least the House of Representatives in decades, would substantially overhaul the crisis that we see. In addition to that, we passed our House Appropriations Bill dealing with Homeland Security. In that House Appropriations Bill, we added additional Border Patrol agents. We added merit pay bonuses for those agents who had been there for a while. We put money in the budget for technology. And we even said, hey, we got to get back to building the wall. Something that I think many of us will agree is a, has to be a part of that comprehensive package. And so for my friends across the aisle who want to place a blame on Republicans that we haven't done anything, Look at our bills that are sitting over there on Chuck Schumer's desk that he's not taking up in the Senate. As they continue to sit there, as they continue to fiddle, Rome burns. And you are having to deal with the aftermath of that. And so I have a question for you, and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene talked a little bit about this. We've repeatedly had the secretary here. He's come here time and time and time again. And every time that he's been asked a question by me and my colleagues, he has repeatedly said that our southwest border is secure. Regardless of the facts and figures and anything that statistically you show him where that is not the case, that is what he continues to hang his hat on, that this border is secure and that there is no crisis. Well, we know there's a crisis because you see it. And so my question here in the last uh, just 30 seconds that I have, and I'm gonna ask all, of, all four of our witnesses a very simple yes or no question. Do you believe that there is a crisis at the southern border and is the border secure? So I guess I'm going to ask each of you two questions. Is the border secure? We'll start there. And the second one is, do you believe that there's a crisis? Uh, Attorney General Knudsen, we'll begin with you. 
Congressman, the, the southern border is absolutely not secure, and this is far beyond a crisis at this point. Similarly, it is not secure, and we have a crisis. General Brahman, uh, General Bailey. The border is not secure in the crisis of historically epic proportion. And Mr. Bowman. As I said at the outset, I'm not an, an expert on immigration policy. I don't have any, any opinion on this question. What's your personal opinion? My personal opinion is that there is, uh, as there has been for decades, and indeed probably a century and a half in this country, a lot of controversy about immigration policy. And there's, been con there's controversy about uh, the way in which immigration policy is being administered at the southern border. I think at the moment we seem to have more problems in that area than we've had in some past eras. Yes. Thank you for your very politically correct answer. So with that, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Ivey of Maryland for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all of you all for coming today. Just briefly, I wanted to respond to the comment about um, legislation sitting on Senator Schumer's desk. I, you know, with respect to H.R. 2, um, I, I think it was clear before it was passed, frankly, as we came through the committee here, Democrats offered amendments, all of which were rejected. Republicans put in poison pill language, especially res with respect to not only abortion on some of these bills, but cutting off federal funding to uh, agencies and, you know, social, uh, social support groups like Red Cross, Christ uh, Catholic Church, and the like. So the fact that you sent it over there knowing it was DOA, I think, is not um, much to uh, praise uh, for the effort. But more importantly, although Speaker Johnson sent all of us home three weeks early, um, the Senate stayed, and the Democrats and Republicans were actually working on bipartisan legislation to try and address the border crisis, working with the White House and, yes, Secretary Mayorkas to try and find an agreement. Meanwhile, the House Republicans, instead of working with that group and joining in those negotiations, did a road trip to Texas for a photo op opportunity to talk about the issues at the border. So if we want to get serious about it, oh, and by the way, President Biden sent uh, supplemental legislation, and I think it was in September with for additional funding, no response from the Republican colleagues. So if you can, um, so, you know, part of that's what's one of the minor things addressed in this article behind me, worst Congress ever, that goes to the ineffectiveness of this Congress under the House Republican leadership to get anything done that's a critical. We've probably gone through the issues of pending legislation, Israel, Ukraine, FISA, all the things that haven't got done that need to get done. The border's another one. I hope my Republican colleagues will get busy on that. Uh, with respect to the, the actual uh, issue of impeachment from a legal standpoint, I went through the testimony that the uh, generals provided. I only saw two paragraphs in all three of your testimony with respect to that, and none of it actually spoke to the language in the Constitution. Um, with respect to treason, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanors. Uh, and, and I thought that was interesting. I, 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 you know, Professor Turley, um, who is not necessarily my favorite, but Republicans seem to like him. He testifies a lot. In fact, at the opening hearing for the impeachment hearings against Joseph Biden, uh, the Oversight Committee uh, leadership called three experts to testify. Turley was one of the three. And one of the things Turley said, like he's saying here, is that there's no basis for impeachment. He's taken this position with respect to Secretary Mayorkas. Um, and, you know, the fact that none of the witnesses that have been called today by the Republicans actually have that kind of experience with respect to impeachment and expertise in it, I thought was interesting. I, I'll, I'll add this, too. You can put it down. Um, we want to add to the record a couple of documents. One is... Um, the Turley letter, which I'll offer in a moment. But the second is an, a letter, uh, uh, an op-ed that was written by Joshua Matz and uh, Norm Eisen, who are members of, who are former members of the House Judiciary Committee who've actually worked on impeachment hearings before. And they talked about the absence of evidence to support impeachment here. And a couple of, of respects that I think are important that we go through. One is the issue of maladministration. So the framers, when they put the, the provision and they went through different iterations of it, but they ended up with the language they've got, but excluded a term like maladministration so that we wouldn't have impeachment hearings for policy differences. Because, and this is James Madison, 
If we did that, the Senate could be picking and choosing and throwing out people. Just on policy disagreements, we're really that we should leave that to the president. The president gets to make a selection, pick his cabinet or her cabinet, hopefully one day, and make the decisions on who should be ruling there. Um, the issue here, and that's pointed out in the Eisen letter, uh, and with respect to the group of uh, professors led by Lawrence Tribe and others who point this out, this is just a maladministration dispute. My colleagues over here are talking about the borders run amok and all of that, and I, you know, I hear that point, but that's just a policy difference. I haven't, the, in the testimony that was given, points about bribery, treason, crime, high crimes and misdemeanors don't seem to have been made. There's no legal violation, there's no criminal act, there's no basis that the framers were looking for to remove a, a, a cabinet member from office. That's a very serious step and by the way, I got a printout of all of the impeachment legislation that my colleagues have put together. I, I think Ms. Taylor Greene alone just has eight impeachment resolutions in this Congress, eight. Uh, three, uh, I think, against Secretary Mayorkas. So if we're going to be serious about this, let's, let's try and get to the issues with respect to the actual legal piece. And I apologize, Mr. Chairman, but I'll, I'll conclude there. And I look forward to actually having a debate and experts who can speak to this uh, from expertise or scholarship on the issue of the standard for impeachment. The gentleman yields. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Lalota, for his five minutes of questions. More than any other cabinet secretary in America's history, Secretary Mayorkas is failing America. But don't take my word for it. 68% of Americans disapprove of the Biden administration's handling of the southern border. 68%. 75% of Americans see the border situation as either a crisis or a serious problem. 75%. So while our country is divided on so many policy issues, there is overwhelming support from across America for Secretary Mayorkas to finally secure our southern border. 68% and 75%. Yet the administration and my colleagues from the other side of the aisle won't change their border policies. Secretary Mayorkas won't change his policies or approach. The administration won't reinstate Remain in Mexico, and blue cities won't repeal their sanctuary city policies. Um, Secretary Mayorkas won't change his border policies, all while tens of thousands of Americans are dying from the fentanyl being smuggled across his open border. Secretary Mayorkas won't and can't properly vet the tens of thousands of migrants he is paroling into our country from nations with whom America is adversarial. So here we are. So what do we in this Congress do when somewhere around 75% of our constituents, and by the way, from blue districts and red districts and purple districts, want accountability, 75%. What do we do when tens of thousands of Americans are dying? What do we do when potentially hundreds of terrorist sleeper cells are being hatched every day inside of America's borders. What do we do? Do we do nothing? Do we wrap ourselves in some sort of bureaucracy and find some sort of legal reasoning not to do anything? Or do we act? And let me state quite clearly that I do not take impeachment lightly. Impeachment is meant for the most serious, grave circumstances when there is a true failure and willful dereliction of duty has occurred. And in this case, Secretary Mayorkas has committed three specific violations which warrant impeachment. He has neglected his duty to secure our border. He has abused his power to exercise proper discretion over America's immigration process. And Secretary Mayorkas has breached America's public trust. And no matter what the secretary or the president say, the numbers speak for themselves. Since President Biden has been in office, there have been 4.5 million migrant encounters at the Southwest border in addition to over 1.2 million gotaways who evaded U.S. Border Patrol agents in the last two years. Those numbers are larger than the population of Los Angeles, the second largest city in the United States. And let me be abundantly clear, this is not the failure of the hardworking men and women who are out there every day in the front line of this crisis. This is a failure of leadership at the highest levels, right up to Secretary Mayorkas and President Biden. And while there are at least three criteria which merit Secretary Mayorkas's impeachment and removal, today I would like to focus on just one of them, Secretary Mayorkas neglecting his duty to secure the border. 
Pener Attorney General Knudsen, good to be with you here today, sir. And thanks for uh, your hard work keeping your residents in Montana safe. Uh, in October, sir, you joined a coalition of 27 state attorneys general in a petition urging Secretary Mayorkas to end his uh, policy of mass catch and release. And I was hoping that you could define, sir, for Americans who may be watching from home today uh, and may be not so familiar with this topic, uh, what catch and release means, sir. Thank you, Congressman, I can. So generally speaking, uh, Congressman, under, under 8 U.S.C. 1225, uh, the law is very clear. The, the secretary has a duty to detain every single alien that enters the country, period. Hard stop, shall be detained. Uh, there is one exception. There's a case-by-case -case exception listed under Section 1182, which allows on a case-by-case -case individual temporary basis for either humanitarian or for, for public justice reasons, uh, an exception. Under Secretary Mayorkas's direction, uh, that basically has been turned into not a case-by-case -case analysis, but rather a mass catch and release, uh, where those individuals are no longer given an in individual investigation, uh, an in in individual notice to appear in front of a judge. Uh, they were given a notice to report. Uh, that appears nowhere in the federal register. That appears nowhere in federal law and was basically used as a mass catch and release program. So that's so, what we're talking about. So would about. you agree that the mass catch and release that is not done on a case-by-case -case basis is inconsistent with the laws passed by Congress and signed into law by both, uh, by presidents of both parties? Absolutely, Congressman. There is no legal authority anywhere in federal code for mass release of immigrants into this country. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, the chair uh, now recognizes the gentleman from New, New Jersey, Mr. Menendez, for his five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm frustrated that Republicans on this committee have chosen to engage in this political exercise and are proceeding to willfully misinterpret the U.S. Constitution and every precedent from the past 250 years by impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. Last week, one of our Republican colleagues said he was not likely to support any compromise border bill because, quote, I'm not willing to do too damn much right now to help a Democrat and to help Joe Biden's approval rating. I will not help the Democrats try to improve this man's dismal approval ratings. I'm not going to do it. Why would I? End quote. Why would he? Because we need to work together to address the critical issues that our committee has jurisdiction over. Because we owe it to our constituents and our communities to meet this moment. But that's not what this hearing is about. Because when you talk about approval ratings and not wanting to help Democrats, not wanting to help this administration, not wanting to help our president, you undermine the seriousness of what is being discussed today. And you make clear what this has always been, political pursuit. Speaking of politics, I have a few yes or no questions for the three attorney generals here today. You are all elected officials, is that correct? Yes. I was appointed to my office subject to election by the people. Understood. And you are all Republicans, is that correct? Yes. And lastly, in 2016 and 2020, President Trump won in the states that you serve as Attorney General of? Yes. Yes. So it's fair to conclude that it's politically beneficial for you to be supportive of the former president and his policies and oppose President Biden's policies, as is the case for all of our Republican colleagues here on this committee. But constitutional law is clear on this point. Policy, political differences are not appropriate grounds for impeachment. Mr. Bowman, is that correct? Yes or no? It is. Thank you. House Republicans have said they will not support, quote, another dime, end quote, for DHS until the enactment of H.R. 2, their extreme anti-immigrant border bill that would severely restrict our legal immigration system, a bill that would endanger migrant lives by denying asylum seekers their legal right to seek protection in the United States and reinstating dangerous policies that force migrants to remain in unsafe conditions such as remain in Mexico. But Republicans know that H.R. 2 is so cruel and unworkable that it will never become law. But that's what they use to say we're doing something here. That's what we're doing on this committee and this Congress. Instead, Republicans could support President Biden's request for funding for more CBP officers and fentanyl detection technology to increase CBP's capacity to identify bad actors and drugs at our southern border. But no, they won't support this funding or any solution that would help this administration carry out border security efforts because it would weaken their political talking points. That's been their strategy this entire administration. In this committee, we have real opportunities to work on substantive issues together across the aisle. 
Instead, my Republican colleagues are distorting this committee and its mandate to safeguard our nation's homeland security into a vehicle for false narratives about migrants and the border. Professor Bowman, let me ask you a question. Is it appropriate to impeach Secretary Mayorkas because of policy dis disagreements? No. Is it appropriate to impeach Secretary Mayorkas because Republicans refuse to properly fund DHS and allow him to do his job? Well, I don't want to characterize um, the actions of the Republicans, but certainly you don't, you don't impeach me. We'll take your first part of the answer. Politics. Professor Bowman, is it appropriate to impeach Secretary Mayorkas because Republicans would rather narrate a crisis to score political points than work with the administ administration to strengthen the security of our border? Certainly not impeach, it's, it's certainly not appropriate to impeach a cabinet officer over political or policy disagreements. I agree. Uh, Attorney General Drummond, um, thank you for your testimony, your in testimony. I went through it, I appreciate it. This day and age, we deal a lot with sourcing and uh, citations. I noticed there was a single source in yours and it was to the Federation for American Immigration Reform. Uh, are you aware that the Southern Poverty Law Center has designated the Federation for American Immigration Reform as a hate group whose leaders have ties to white nationalists? I'm not. Yeah, um, completely understandable. I would just let you know that a lot of the sources that have been used in all this investigative materials and reports have been put forth by the majority have relied on far-right, anti-immigrant um, think tanks and groups that are not aligned with what I believe our country's morals and values are. And that's a problem with a lot of the reports that this hearing, that this impeachment process and procedure has been based on. Um, and that's where this all falls apart for me. Uh, I really wish we were engaging in a thoughtful uh, exercise. I really wish we were trying to solve some of the challenges that we're facing, but that's not what today is about. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Uh <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Goldman referenced two articles, uh, Turley uh, and Eisen, and the clerk has already collected them, but it was just a unanimous consent to so, include them in the record. Actually, uh, Mr. Ivey. Yeah, I think I was watching back there. I saw it was Mr. Ivey. So, yeah, so ordered and... Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today and providing this important testimony. Um, uh, let, let's be cl clear about this. The Biden administration and Secretary Mayorkas uh, did not inherit uh, the crisis at the border. They created it. Ignoring the desperate pleas from affected and scared families nationwide, Secretary Mayorkas has intentionally disregarded the law, leaving the border open to an endless stream of migrants, drug, and cartel members. My time as a sheriff, and uh, if I was neglecting my duties to enforce the law, it would have cost me my job. The secretary should be held to the same standard. Uh, Mr. Drummond, uh, your story about the illegal Chinese national who executed the three men, uh, that's really stuck with me. Uh, the reports are clear that terrorist organizations are exploiting the vulnerability of our nation's border. It is simply irresponsible that Secretary Mayorkas continues to ignore the significant threat to our national security. Do you believe Secretary Mayorkas' actions have emboldened terrorists around the world? And is it fair to say he has intentionally ignoring our nation's current laws that should make it harder to enter our country illegally? I think that it is indisputable that we have uh, terrorist, terrorist organizations invading my state. We've identified numerous gangs, numerous syndicated crime organizations, and they only grow on a daily basis. Mr. Knudsen and Mr. Bailey, would you care to comment on this as well? I would point out that uh, the two lawsuits that we have pending right now dealing with the parole process, the abuse of the parole process, Secretary Mayorkas' violation of the plain text of the statute as it relates to parole and his promulgation of the circumvention rule have been described as engaging in a child trafficking delivery service. So it's not just that he's emboldening the enemies of the United States, he's actually actively participating in some of the harms by using uh, support networks to allow for illegal immigration that used to be considered unlawful through the stroke of, of his pen without congressional authority. Congressman, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I, I can tell you the, the increased um, gang activity in my state. I can tell you the increase in firearm crime in my state, increase in officer-involved shootings, 
uh, we can tie this all directly to the, the cartel drug problems that is flooding my state. Uh, we've, we've seen fentanyl seizures in my state rise by some measurements up from 11,000% in my state just since 2019. Uh, those are numbers that we were not seeing prior to this administration change. I, I think that's pretty staggering. Thank you. Mr. Drummond, in your state and many others, we've had taken steps to safeguard our communities because we, we cannot rely on this administration to protect us. For example, Mississippi, my home state, has set up a fentanyl strike force uh, to tackle the influx of drugs. I noticed that the state of Oklahoma has also uh, formed a uh, similar task force. Uh, can you elaborate on some of the findings of that task force? Yes, um, we have created an organized crime task force with the explicit purpose of co coordinating with other state agencies to tackle this uh, endemic of illegal immigration in the state of Oklahoma and the drugs and the, and the detriment that they drag into the state. And uh, it's come at an, an extremely high cost for the state. We've allocated an additional $3 million from my office just to staff that. And the, the toll on human, uh, it, it's just remarkable. Are there any recommendations, the task force findings uh, that you could recommend to the Congress to consider uh, implementing on a federal level? It would be very helpful if uh, the terrorism category, if cartels would be listed as uh, foreign terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. Right now, they, they fall outside that immigration and admissibility uh, def definition, and if they were designated as such, it would give us strength in deportation. Also in your testimony, you pointed out that smaller law enforcement departments are outmanned, outgunned, and ill-equipped to address the threats coming across our border, particularly the threats from the Mexican and Chinese drug syndicates. Uh, I can sympathize uh, with this and certainly understand the stress that is placed on our rural law enforcement officers when dealing with such a rise in crime. As departments are forced and stressed their resources uh, addressing pressing issues, uh, can you talk a little bit about the ripple effects and the gaps it leaves in our critical areas of law enforcement uh, and safety for our communities? It, it has truly taken the attention of all law enforcement in the state of Oklahoma toward this issue, where we have uh, you know, a, a shell owner buying a prop piece of property, pushing up berms of dirt with bulldozers, manning those with uh, semi-automatic weapons at the top, very intimidating for our local law enforcement. They're outgunned, outmanned, and our limit, our, our resources are stretched in the state. Thank you, Mr. Drummond, and the other witnesses as well for your input today. Once again, the committee has shown that Secretary Mayorkas bears direct responsibility for the chaos at the border. I will not tolerate the overlooking of real threats that are jeopardizing innocent lives. His failures demand swift accountability. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman Yields, I now recognize the gentlelady from Nevada, uh, Ms. Titus, for her five minutes of question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. You know, it, often I see my colleagues uh, across the aisle brandishing the Constitution like a sword. You love to quote it, you love to cite it, you love to talk about what the Founding Fathers intended, that original intent, but it's kind of like Shakespeare in the Bible. Those who talk about it the most have seldom read it and really may not understand what's in there. You know, if you talk about original intent, uh, you, you're saying what the Founding Fathers intended. Now, that's a smaller country, smaller population, smaller budget. We had no AI, we had no drones. How do we know what they intended? Well, often we don't, but in this case, we know exactly what they intended. All you have to do is look at some of the notes from the Convention of the Constitution by Madison, who did not want to include the uh, maladministration because it was too broad and policy-oriented. Look at Federalist Paper 65 by Hamilton, a conservative at the time, who did not want to uh, include this broader interpretation of impeachment. Now, you've also heard Mr. Bowman's arguments of respected scholar who you have demeaned his expertise by insinuating, oh, he's just a democratic uh, witness. Uh, but he is not alone in this position. Mr. Turley's letter was mentioned. Uh, there is an article in The Hill about another letter from legal scholars. This is a group of legal scholars who wrote a letter to our chairman and the leadership of the House, uh, Speaker Johnson, 
that says their proposed grounds for impeaching Mayorkas are the stuff of ordinary policy disagreement in the field of immigration enforcement. They go on to say that uh, this is inappropriate. They admit they have varying views on the wisdom and success of Mallorca's work on the immigration policy, but they say you cannot have impeachment based on this policy. It is a, I quote, stark departure from the Constitution. Now, these legal scholars included in this letter are Donald Ayer, who served as U.S. Deputy Attorney General under George H.W. Bush, Stuart Gearson, who served as acting U.S. Attorney General during Clinton and also served in the Justice Department under Bush. You have Mr. Turley also included in this. There's even a quote by Durskowitz who says that this is inappropriate use of impeachment. So Mr. Bowman, in, with his expertise, does not stand alone in condemning this use of impeachment for political reasons. Now, I look at this resolution that we're supposed to be considering that was offered by Ms. Taylor Green, and uh, aside from the fact that it's got some punctuation and grammatical errors, it lists some ways that the, uh, the secretary has been effective in the, the amount of fentanyl that has been seized at the border. The number of people who were caught on the terrorist watch list before they came into the country. Those are all evidence that he is carrying out his duty. What I don't see anywhere in this resolution, nor have I heard from any of my colleagues, nor any of our attorneys general, is how impeaching the secretary is gonna solve all these problems. How's it gonna get rid of these illegal grow places in Oklahoma? How's it gonna get rid of all the terrorists who are coming into Missouri? How is it gonna solve the fentanyl problem uh, in, in these other, whatever other states, oh, Montana, uh, because we've gotten rid of Mr. Mayorkas. If anybody can add that and tell us how getting rid of him is gonna make a difference, I'd like to hear it. We hear over in the Senate, Mr. Lankford, Senator Lankford, who is a Republican, saying, well, you can just switch one secretary for another, it's not gonna make any difference. So perhaps we could talk about how getting rid of Mr. Mayorkas through this uh, impeachment process is gonna make a difference. Now, I hear nothing. Did, did you want, so, does the general lady yield? No, I'm not going to. Okay, all right. So since I gave you, I gladly, I gladly answer the question. I gave you an opportunity. I gave you an okay. I'll yield. I'll okay, yield. all right. I'll well, yield. in in my previous testimony, I've shared that the policies that he's implemented has allowed the cartels. And actually, Merrick Garland agreed with this that that they're flooding the crossing sites, tying up the border patrol, causing them to concentrate, and then the 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 fentanyl and the other things are coming across the border outside. Now I get the, the argument that's often made about what's captured is mostly captured You're at the crossing site. You're not answering my, I can take my time back. Okay, Thank all right. Chairman. You're not answering my question, how getting rid of Mayorkas is gonna solve these problems. What you really wanna do is get rid of President Biden. You wanna get rid of President Biden and then perhaps you can put your own secretary in there that will come up with different policy. But just impeaching Mayorkas, We'll, we'll have another appointment of another secretary who follows the policy of the administration, and you won't like that either. So thank you, Mr. Bowman, for your expertise, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. D'Esposito, for his five minutes question. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's clear that uh, the, the disapproval of the policies of Joe Biden and Secretary Mayorkas are not just specific uh, to Republicans or conservatives. The numbers that were shared by my good friend from New York, Mr. Lalota, 75% of people have said that the border is the biggest issue facing this country. You talk about numbers, fiscal year 21, since fiscal year 21, 8,542,000 people have come across our borders, over 3 million in fiscal year 23. In November, 308,000 and change, 242,000 at our southern border. 312 terrors, terrorists who have come across on our terror watch list in fiscal year 21. 1 1.8 million gotaways that we know about and many more that we don't. It's cost cities and states throughout this country $451 billion with a B. There's been over 70,000 Americans killed by fentanyl that have come across but from cartels. We've been asked the question, is this about policy? Or is this about the things that Mayorkas 
has committed. Well, if you ask me, all those numbers is a complete betrayal to this country. We talk, and has been mentioned by colleagues, that again, this is political theater. This is Republicans, conservatives, using the border as a narrative as we go towards an election. But this isn't a narrative. It's not one created by the Republicans. And I'll, I'll take us back to my home state of New York, where you have Democrats. Our governor has said flat out, there's no room left in New York. There's no room at the inn. Don't send migrants here anymore. We've heard a Democrat city mayor, Mayor Adams, who I disagree with virtually everything about, but this I actually agree with. He has said that the migrant issue in New York City will destroy New York. So this doesn't seem like it's political theater. It doesn't seem like it's a narrative that's been created by Republicans and conservatives because you now have Democrats in these blue states and, and sanctuary states and cities who agree with us. Just last night, we had children told in New York City that they can no longer attend school in person. They have to do it virtually because their school is now being used to house migrants. Now just think about that for a second. We want to talk about the failed policies. This isn't just a policy. This is intent. Mayorkas has intentionally, <clears throat> intentionally betrayed this country. People are claiming that they want to come here for a better way of life for democracy, for a chance at that American dream, for a better education. And yet children who came here correctly, children who were born here, last night were told that they cannot go to school because there's no room for them because it's being used by migrants. That's the height of hypocrisy. And if you ask me, it is a betrayal of this country. Mr. Gettner Drummond, in, the, in your testimony, you talked about how smaller law enforcement agencies feel that they are ill-equipped to handle the threats stemming from the border crisis. Can you talk about how the border crisis impacts the resources of smaller police agencies and what the officers in those departments are feeling? Well, certainly it strains the resources and it is wildly intimidating to our local law enforcement where they have maybe a, a police force of three or four in a community of 2,000, and yet they have four or five illegal grows that are populated by illegal immigrants, Mexican cartel members, Chinese syndicated crime organization members, with semi-assault, semi-automatic rifles uh, abundant, and they are unwilling to go in. And I know the answer to this, but I want to ask it so it's on the record, because I think it's another clear indicator of Mayorkas' failure of his oath and the fact that he's betrayed this country. Do you know or have you experienced law enforcement agencies, to your knowledge, that have said that they have lacked notification and information and intelligence sharing from federal partners when it comes to uh, migrants? I, I would say the, the cooperation with our federal agencies is high in Oklahoma. We have an excellent repu working relationship. So I commend the federal agencies working with Oklahoma. I think it goes at a higher level and that's the implementation of the laws of, of the United States. Right. Ms. Benutza, do you want to comment on that? Only to, I completely agree with my colleague here. The, the, the level of cooperation with, with the federal DEA, uh, with our U.S. Attorney's Office in Montana has been very, very high and very excellent. Uh, Customs and Border Patrol, I might add. We're a northern tier state. We work with them a lot. Uh, but certainly the message has come down from Secretary Mayorkas and from on high that uh, we're going to just flagrantly ignore portions of federal law. And, and that is really the point that I was trying to make. He has made it very clear that he wants to ignore federal law. There are, uh, you're lucky in your states to have great communications, but there has been, and there have been testimony in this very uh, committee of people who led local law enforcement agencies who have said, I mean, take for example, uh, the airport and JFK where they were housing migrants, where there was zero communications between law enforcement agencies uh, because they just didn't want to share the information. Uh, with that, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. I now recognize Mr. Goldman, the gentleman from New York, for his five minutes questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I find it really difficult to sit here listening to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle slander personally a cabinet secretary who has committed much of his life to this government and our public service. 
He was a U.S. attorney. He's worked multiple stints in the Department of Homeland Security. And you're certainly welcome to disagree with how he executes his job. You're welcome to criticize him. You're welcome to make the case to the American people as to why Secretary Mayorkas, in executing President Joe Biden's immigration policy, should be removed from office at the ballot box. But to come in here over and over and over again and to personally attack and slander without any evidence a cabinet secretary who has committed so much of his life to this country, who himself comes from a Cuban family escaping difficult circumstances in his country, who is an immigrant and immigrant family himself. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's enough. You want to talk policy? Let's talk policy. I agree we have problems at the border. Let's talk about how we can solve them. But instead of actually going over to the Senate, this committee, which has the Committee of Jurisdiction over Border Policy, that is being negotiated right now by a bipartisan group in the Senate with Secretary Mayorkas, instead of actually engaging in those substantive negotiations to reach some sort of a bipartisan agreement to address the problems, we are sitting here with a charade of a sham impeachment hearing with expert impeachment witnesses who are Republican officials, uh, political officials suing the Department of Homeland Security. Another hearing. It's the same hearing we've had 10, 12 times. Same pig, different lipstick, because we're now going to call it an impeachment hearing. So who do we have here? And I am sure all three of you are excellent attorneys general. Um, but I have never heard your names mentioned in the category of Mr. Bowman, who is a legal expert on impeachment. And as far as I can tell, none of your states actually are, are on the border. So I don't understand why we are sitting here in a, quote, impeachment hearing with three attorneys general from different states who are Republican officials and have absolutely no expertise on impeachment. The reason is because the last time the Republicans did that and they brought in their so-called experts on impeachment for the first and only oversight public hearing, they were embarrassed because their own experts acknowledged that there is insufficient evidence to impeach President Biden. So who do we have here? We have attorneys general who are suing Secretary Mayorkas and the government to stop him from implementing his policy to address the issues at the border. That's right. So one, one rule that uh, the department has implemented was the asylum processing rule, which would allow asylum officers rather than immigration courts to decide asylum applications for those placed in expedited removal to significantly expedite the process. That might reduce the backlog. That might create a disincentive to come. That's something that Secretary Mayorkas did to address the border. No, you sued him to stop him from doing that. How about the circumvention rule? Well, that is the circumvention, excuse me. How about the, uh, the asylum circumvention rule, which says that you have to either appear at a port of entry or have first sought asylum from a neighboring country? That would reduce the people who could apply for asylum. No, you sued them. You sued them to stop them from doing that. And how about trying to address the uh, parole decisions to allow some people to come in and be able to actually have work authorizations so that they are not just sitting on the dole? No, you sued them. So this is what we have. We have Republicans suing Secretary Mayorkas to stop him from implementing his policy to address the issues of the border. And now we're going to impeach him because you say he's not addressing the issues at the border. Which do you want? I yield back. The gentleman yields, I now recognize Ms. Lee, for uh, the gentlelady from Florida, for five minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Much has been said today by our colleagues across the aisle about this hearing and the purposes for it. It's been called a waste of time. It's been called a charade. It's been suggested that it's repetitive or unnecessary. To suggest that this hearing is any of those things or to suggest that this hearing is tantamount to nothing more than a discussion of policy differences is to fundamentally deny the seriousness, the scope, the scale of the catastrophe at our southern border and the testimony of these witnesses who are here today and every witness that has come before them to testify in front of this committee about the seriousness of this crisis. We are here today because Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has intentionally gone around and subverted the immigration laws of the United States of America. We are here today because Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has repeatedly defied orders from courts directing him to cease and desist certain policies which he continues to utilize. We are here today because the Department of Homeland Security has defied inquiries from Congress trying to get to the bottom of the scope and the scale of this crisis. And we are here today because Secretary Mayorkas has defied congressional directives related to spending, congressional directives as to how money was supposed to be spent. We are here because there is an unchecked flood of illegal immigration at our southern border that is destroying not just border communities, but communities around our country. Today alone, we have heard extraordinary and compelling testimony about the utter lawlessness that is occurring in this administration. Attorney General Knudsen shared with us that he perceives a refusal to faithfully execute the laws of the United States and shared stories from his state about human trafficking and fentanyl trafficking and the devastation that has occurred because of our wide open southern border. Attorney General Drummond commented on the failure to enforce our laws and how that has affected his state. He also shared the extraordinary cost that it incurs at his state because we are not enforcing our laws in our border. And Attorney General Bailey touched on the issue of parole, which has become an absolute farce and workaround for following our laws. He <laughs> said perverting the plain text of the law. And indeed, that's exactly what is happening. In my state, Florida, we too have been forced to sue the Department of Homeland Security to attempt to achieve any semblance of lawful behavior and policy. United States District Court Judge Kent Weatherall, in an order directing that Secretary Mayorkas vacate the parole program, said, quote, Secretary Mayorkas has turned the southern border into a meaningless line in the sand and little more than a speed bump for aliens flooding into the country. With that backdrop, Attorney General Bailey, I'd like to turn your attention specifically to the question of parole authority. On July 26, 2023, before the House Judiciary Committee, Secretary Mayorkas testified, the Department of Homeland Security has used our parole authority consistent with the law and consistent with past practices of different administrations. He also claimed that his department is using the parole authority uh, consistent with the law still. In your opinion, is Secretary Mayorkas's implementation of the parole statute lawful and is his implementation of this policy affecting the security of the United States? His policy implementation is unlawful in violation of the plain text of the statute, thereby forcing a lawsuit from several like-minded state attorneys general because of the drastic, terrible harm that's occurring on the streets in our communities. Attorney General Drummond, you shared some of the devastating effects that failure to secure our border is having on your state. In your opinion, are these policies affecting the security and safety of your state and of our country? The laws of the Immigration and Nationality Act are clear and unequivocal, and they are not being upheld. And Attorney General Knudsen, would you share your perspective on the harm to your state and our country that is being posed by failure uh, to follow our laws? 1,700% increase in fentanyl deaths, confirmed state crime lab fentanyl deaths since 2019, Congresswoman. Uh, 
11,000 uh, percent increase in fentanyl seizures, uh, multiple hundred percent increase in human trafficking investigations since 2019. Those numbers speak for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady Yields, I now recognize Mr. Gorsuch. You're up. Are you ready or you want to go ahead with somebody else? Okay. Recognize Mr. Garcia for his five minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just want to just uh, reiterate that. I have been said this very many times today by our, our uh, colleagues here um, on the House side, on the Democratic side, that we all know that this impeachment inquiry, this effort to try to impeach the Secretary, uh, is a complete political stunt and sham, and I just want to reiterate that. We all know it's a political ploy that's not grounded in the facts, truth, and has been conjured up for just one simple purpose, and that's to score cheap political points against the Biden administration. We also know that we've had articles from the New York Times and other publications just really laying out that this is all about uh, this pursuit of impeaching Mayorkas. Uh, it's about this kind of effort that's been started, quite frankly, by even a member of this committee uh, for many, many, many months. Um, that's all just in, really about hurting the president. Now, Professor Bowman, Republican leaders have been quoted promising donors that they would impeach Secretary Mayorkas and fundraisers back in April of 2023. Do you believe this committee has uncovered any evidence of high crimes or misdemeanors since that time? Not that I'm aware of. And thank you. And let's, let's be clear. What we're moving ahead with today is because extremists, including some folks uh, that are in this committee, have demanded it over and over again. Now, I want to give a couple of quotes from some members of the House. Uh, Congressman Andy Biggs told Newsmax that Republicans, quote, have nothing to campaign on. And he said that he was embarrassed by this. Now, Congressman Chip Roy has said, and I want to quote, I want my Republican colleagues to give me one thing, one that I can go to campaign on to say that we did, just one, end quote. And in fact, this last Monday, he went on TV to call the Republican conference, and I quote, a continued failure theater, end quote. So I understand that we're trying to throw red meat to an extremist base, but we're wasting the public's time and we know that the Senate will laugh off all of these charges. And let's remember the bigger picture. Some of my friends on the other side of the aisle don't want to really govern. They're not serious about solutions that could actually become law. And they're obstructing $14 billion in emergency supplemental funding. They voted against hiring hundreds of additional Border Patrol agents and of ports of entry, and have opposed the incredible resources that we've tr been trying to send around technology, supporting organizations on the ground, support for Border Patrol agents, and many other types of funding. And I also want to remind the committee and the public that President Biden, on his first day in office, sent a comprehensive immigration plan to Congress, which Republicans have refused to act on. I also want to note that Secretary Mayorkas has continued to try to negotiate a bipartisan, sensible, and humane a, a humane approach to actually fixing our immigration system and trying to actually address the issues that remain along the border. Because Democrats agree there are issues and challenges along the border, and we want to see those fixed. Now, as an immigrant myself, I also have always believed this is a nation of immigrants. We should never forget that this country was based on so much hard work and labor of immigrants that now live all across this country. And our immigration system won't be fixed by this impeachment process, and it certainly won't be fixed by their proposal, which is H.R. 2. And let's set the record straight about H.R. 2. The bill would end Health and Human Services funding for legal representation of unaccompanied children in immigration proceedings. It, it would essentially send children to detention camps. And the bill subjects all unaccompanied children to an accelerated removal process as we know, in horrible conditions at these facilities that we have seen over the last few years. And quite frankly, we know this is not just a solution, not a solution, but it's inhumane and cruel to demonize some of the most vulnerable people that are coming to our country. We want to address the root causes of migration. We want to ensure that legal pathways are followed. We want to make sure that, that folks receive the support they need back in their home countries. And we certainly want, don't want to defund organizations like Catholic Charities that would rip away aid to communities and to migrants across, uh, across our country and along our border. 
The idea that our border problems, which have needed a bipartisan solution for decades, would be solved by HR2 is just not true. It's an anti-immigrant policy, and we should reject it. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize Mr. Luttrell for uh, the gentleman from Texas for his five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming here today. Mr. Bowman, I, I appreciate and respect your opening statements where it's probably the most educated I've been on where it comes to constitution, constitutional law and the process that we're in right now. So thank you for, for that education. Uh, I have a, my first question for you, sir, is can you give me the definition of a high crime and misdemeanor? I think no single definition is satisfactory in every case, but I think Charles Black's is a pretty good general statement. That is to say, high crimes and misdemeanors should be ex extremely serious offenses in the way that uh, serious crimes like treason and bribery are. Extremely serious. So, Second, from, from that, from that I, I, let, me, let me go off of that one, sir. That's a great point. In is some, the selling of fentanyl inside the United States causing hundreds of thousands of deaths over the past years considered a high crime in your opinion? I'm unaware that the secretary has sold any fentanyl. No, 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 I'm not directing that to the secretary. I'm asking you, is the selling of fentanyl inside the United States killing hundreds of thousands of Americans over the years, considered, would be that be considered a high crime? If you could establish that. Boy, that's a officer, yes answer all day long. You if you don't say yes, that's, that's, that's bad, that's bad did juju. that, possibly. All right, so let me ask I'm you this one. aware of no evidence that's, that that ever happened. There's, there's, no, there's no evidence that hundreds of thousands of people over the past few years have died from fentanyl overdoses? I'm unaware of any evidence that Secretary Marcus has ever sold. I, I'm not talking about Secretary Marcus. I'm talking about but fentanyl That's what we're America. here to talk about, are we not, Congressman well, can, Secretary Marcus? If, if you'll allow me to finish, if you'll answer my question, I'm getting to my point. It's your time, so you can, with, you know... All right, so let me ask you this, since we're, un, we're unhinged on the fentanyl deaths, do you consider slavery a high crime? Is there any evidence that Secretary Mayorkas has enslaved anyone? This is getting a little bit more complicated than I thought it was going to be. I want to know if I'm supposed to go back to the folks in my district and tell them that the individual responsible for securing the American borders is falling short because the United States is one of the top countries on the planet for sex slaves. We lose 100,000 people a year to fentanyl overdoses. And the individual responsible for protecting us is Mr. Mayorkas. That's where I'm going with that. The fact that you didn't jump on top of and say that those things were absolutely involuntary, the worst things ever, is graphically disturbing to me. I pitched that one up as a softball, buddy, and you failed miserably. <clears throat> I'm from Texas. I feel this every day. And my colleagues and I, we have our disagreements. And I went down to the border with, my, with the other Republicans. I didn't have a polo on. I didn't get behind the podium. I talked to everybody down there that works down there. I talked to the ranchers, the citizens, and they tell me every single day that we are overwhelmed. And Ms. Titus brought up an amazing point. Yes, if we move, remove Mr. Mayorkas, Mr. Biden will put another Democratic member in that spot. We know that. I'm here for this reason. I'm sending a message that my people can no longer take it. We are dying by the droves. Every year, I have to look at the mothers. I look at the mothers and fathers that lost their kids. I look at them every single day when I'm out in the district. And it's all coming across our southern border. Through the ports of entry, yes, I got it. But if you're responsible for securing our, our borders, then you better act like it. And this individual is not, and that is the problem, sir. Period, in a discussion. These atrocities that we are seeing, you can't explain. 40 million people are enslaved on the planet. 40 million. And America is leading up top with that problem. And you ask where they come from, they come across our southern border and our northern border. And that, sir, is the responsibility of the secretary. And since he has failed to conduct his job for the past few years, we need somebody else. Now, I'm not, I'm Mr. Mayorkas, I, I've chatted him up. He is a family man, he's a good man. And I'm gonna be crucified going back home and saying that. I've spoken face to face. 
And I, he, he, I, I bet he adamantly disagree, would disagree on the fact that yes, slavery is horrible. The fentanyl deaths are horrible. But there was a mother sitting in front of this committee months ago, last year, that sat there and looked at every single one of us. She lost her mother and her daughter to a coyote running through the town. Killed them both. She had, to, she had to stand there in the emergency room while her daughter died. She looked us all in the face and said, you guys are absolutely doing nothing. You're doing nothing. So when we go to Mr. Mayorkas and say, hey, we need to act on this, and nothing's happening, sir, that is an absolute problem. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields, I now recognize Ms. Clark from New York, the gentlelady from New York, for her five minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Uh, let me first start by thanking our witnesses for joining us this, this afternoon, uh, today. Uh, you know, it's clear that MAGA Republican attempts to impeach Secretary Mayorkas have nothing to do with his performance and everything to do with the loyalty oath most of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have sworn to Donald Trump. After the House twice impeached Donald Trump, once for attempting to bribe an ally to investigate his political opponent and interfere in U.S. elections, and again for inciting an insurrection against the Capitol to steal an election, some of my Republican colleagues want to settle the score by impeaching someone, anyone, in the Biden administration. Secretary Mayorkas was sworn in on February 2nd of 2022. Less than six weeks later, Senator Lindsey Graham floated the secretary should resign during an appearance on Fox News. In May of 2021, Congressman Biggs appeared on the first and said that Secretary Mayorkas has got to go and introduced articles of impeachment the secretary of the secretary in August of that year. The secretary had not yet served six months. Other Republicans piled on that call in the months that followed. In April, Chairman Green fundraised off his planned impeachment efforts, telling his donors to, quote, get out the popcorn, unquote. But Secretary Mayorkas is hardly the only member of the Biden administration Republicans have disagreed with and then tried to impeach. Congressman Perry filed articles of impeachment against Attorney General Garland in October of 2021. Congresswoman Taylor Greene filed articles of, to impeach the Attorney General in August of 2022, FBI Director Christopher Wray in May of 2022, and filed multiple articles of impeachment against President Biden, sometimes more than one time in the same day. Congressman Norman filed articles of impeachment against Secretary Blinken in August of 2021, and Congressman Mills filed articles of impeachment against Secretary Austin in August of 2023. Meanwhile, Republicans have filed multiple resolutions to expunge the impeachment of Donald Trump. I'm concerned that my Republican colleagues fail to understand the gravity of impeachment. So, uh, Professor Bowman, the founders engaged in robust debate when defining the criteria for impeachment. In your view, did the founders intend for impeachment to be a frequently used process to coerce the executive branch into policy decisions or a rarely used tool reserved for extraordinary behavior that meets the definition of high crimes and misdemeanors? Certainly the second, Congresswoman. I mean, the key point here is not only that impeaching Secretary Mayorkas will, affect, will affect absolutely no change, in border policy, border legislation. But even if impeaching uh, a cabinet secretary could really accomplish something consequential, it would be terrible for the country because it would overthrow the basic principle of separation of powers in which, uh, on which the Constitution and our system of government are actually based. Congress and the executive are supposed to work together to solve the country's problems. They're often gonna disagree about how to do that. But in our system, the solution is the hard work of legislation, of negotiation, of compromise, of coalition building. Uh, impeachment is not and never has been the answer. And it is quite clear that the framers intended it not for that purpose whatsoever. They intended it for the most extraordinary circumstances and simply to resolve you know, a, 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 a partisan political debate 
or to change policy is not it. Thank you um, for your response. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady Yields, I now recognize Mr. Strong. And uh, for the committee room, Mr. Strong will be the last, and then we'll go vote and come back at 2.15. So, Mr. Strong, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General Knutson, um, I was glad to see you mention in your testimony that Secretary Mayorkas has regularly hidden behind the concept of prosecutorial discretion. I like how you said that, because that right there is one of the big issues. Today, specifically, we have talked about Secretary Marcus's abuse of prosecutorial uh, discretion in the uh, enforcement and removal of illegal aliens in the United States. I want to highlight again Secretary Marcus's 2021 memo in which he stated the fact that an individual is a removable alien, therefore, should not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them. He went on uh, to list factors that ICE agents should weigh when deciding whether to pursue enforcement and removal or not. Uh, Attorney General Knutson, as a former prosecutor yourself, does it make, uh, make any sense to give credence to mitigating factors when considering whether to prosecute someone that has already been proven to have broken the law when they crossed our border illegally? Congressman, certainly not, especially when there's specific directive in federal law that requires that person be detained and, and be prosecuted. Uh, the, the idea that individual prosecutorial discretion suddenly means you have the right to blanket en masse pardon people or, or, or parole them into the, the, the heartland of the country, that simply does not exist in statute. I, I, I agree with the concept generally of prosecutorial discretion on a case-by-case -case basis. And indeed, that's what the federal law allows. But that's not what's being done here. It's being just implemented on a mass scale, wide open en masse, and that is simply not justified in anywhere in federal code. Thank you. I must say I was disappointed to see that the factors in favor of uh, removal didn't include the uh, uh, significant financial and human costs to American citizens. Our hospitals are inundated with illegals. Schools are overrun with non-English uh, speaking setting other students back. And now New York has sent teachers and American students home uh, and turning public schools into bunker houses for illegal aliens. This is totally unacceptable. Uh, Attorney uh, General Bailey and Knudsen, you both specifically mentioned in your testimony that you uh, do not view the crisis at the southern border uh, as a resource issue. In other words, you both you each explain to the committee uh, why this is the case. Certainly, that's what our lawsuit about his refusal to build the border wall is all about. He is flaunting the commands of this body. He is nullifying your constitutional authority over the power of the purse. And when that authority is no longer effective, impeachment is the last option. And I would point out that what we have here is not a policy disagreement. It's a willful violation to carry out a this. Mr. Chairman, Congressman, I, I would add that, you know, that resources are being moved down there regularly. I, I mentioned I'm a northern border state. We have nearly 600 miles of border with Canada in my state. There's a large customs and border, con border control contingent in Montana. Most of those individuals have told me they've been, they've been cycled down to the southern border. The problem is not the number of agents down there. The problem is they are being instructed by Secretary Mayorkas to stand down and to not follow federal law. That's the issue here. Thank you. On September the 6th, 2023, the DHS Office of Inspector General released its uh, report titled DHS does not have assurance that all migrants can be located once uh, released into the United States. That title alone should concern every single person in America. This investigation reviewed nearly 1 million migrant records and found that addresses for more than 177,000 migrants were either missing, invalid for delivery, or not legitimate residential locations. That, uh, that's nearly 20% uh, if, you, if you look at this, and that right there is totally unacceptable. We talk about leadership by the Secretary of Homeland Security. Well, you think about this. The first thing that I saw at the southern border on one of my many visits is I noticed 20,288 border wall panels in storage. I came back to DC and found out 
that those 20,288 uh, panels being stored in three different states costing the American taxpayer more than $300 million. This is how they solve or try to work to solve the problem at the southern border. This is totally unacceptable, and this is uh, another reason that we're here. Mr. Bowman, you're a constitutional law expert. Should President Trump have been impeached for a Russian hoax where the Steele dossier was created and paid for by the Clinton campaign? What do you think about that? Should that have, should that have happened? What were you teaching in your classroom? Go, go ahead and answer the question, and then we'll, uh, that'll, the Mr. gentleman's Mr. Chairman, I'll, uh, I'll yield to yeah, you, because I, I know he doesn't want to answer that question. No, no, you, do you not want the gentleman? To, okay. All right. The, the gentleman yields. We will recess now until 2.15. We have two votes. I need to chat real quick with the witnesses just to make sure that you guys can stay. We're in recess. 2.15.
I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bikin, for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses uh, for being here, especially you've got uh, somebody that traveled all the way from Oklahoma to be here. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate after the break, uh, just for the American people to know, you know, it's important that we follow the rule of law. Uh, I, I love, you know, commonly said now, to be the rule of law team um, it requires discipline. It requires focus. It requires that you know we don't turn ourselves into a banana republic. Article two, section four says the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The Constitution absolutely uh, gives authority to impeach and remove the president, vice president, and all civil officers for treason, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanors. This tool was inherited from English practice in which Parliament impeached and convicted ministers and, favor, and favorites of the crown in a, in a struggle to rein in abuse of power. That's the historical precedent on this. And let me back that up, okay? So it's been talked about this morning. Uh, Federalist 65 has some admonitions, has some warnings, and it says the subjects within the context of impeachment in Federalist 65, written by Alexander Hamilton, it says the subjects of its jurisdiction, talking about impeachment, are those offenses in which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. It goes on to say that the model from which the instrument of impeachment, the idea of this institution has been borrowed, pointed out that course to be the convention. In Great Britain, it is the province of the House of Commons to prefer the impeachment and the House of Lords to decide upon it. Two part just like we've employed in our Constitution. Several of the state constitutions have followed this example, as well as the latter, as the former, seem to have regarded the practice of impeachment as the bridle in the hands of the legislative body upon the executive servants of government. You know why I love that? I grew up in the performance horse industry, and uh, I learned three stage stops from a father who trained cutting horses professionally. You sit down, they feel the pressure of that. Then you say, whoa. And then they, a well-trained, well-disciplined animal learns that when they feel the, the three-stage stop coming, they're gonna park it without having to lift the four ounces of the reins of the bridle. The problem is we've got men and, and women who serve in positions of authority, and they, the definition, according to AQHA, of a reining horse, I love this, is, is willfully guided, willfully controlled. The problem is when you have men and women in influence who aren't willfully guided and willfully controlled by the Constitution, the Constitution, and, and as stated by Alexander Hamilton, the job of the, of the legislative body is to grab the reins and say, whoa. And we have an out of, um, out of place, out of their floodplain bureaucrat bureaucracy within Homeland Security that is doing what they want to, not following the, the, the rule of law. So with that said, the question is before us. Are there instances of fact where Mayorkas has flippantly disregarded the laws enacted by Congress? Point one, parole. Section 212D5A of the Immigration Nationality Act says parole shall only be granted on a case-by-case -case basis, only for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit. Mayorkas has not done that. He's created broad parole programs for 30,000 aliens per month, Cuba, um, Haiti, Nicaragua, and, and Venezuela without evidence of humanitarian reasons or without significant public benefit. Point two, resources in FY 2020, Congress explicitly appropriated funds for constructions of barrier systems. So our AG is, is talked about from Missouri. Part of your lawsuit was over this. Barrier systems along the southwest border. My workers refused to comply with Congress's appropriation, refused to build barrier systems, as, as Congress said, as a will of the people, the power of the purse. Point three, detention. Section 235B1 of the Immigration and Nationality Act outlines the procedures by which aliens attempting to enter the United States without a visa or proper immigration papers are to be detained and removed. My workers has not done this. His agency has released several million illegal aliens who should have been detained and deported. Question. Mr. Bowman, you've been invited by the Democrats to, to, to provide your uh, you know, advice as a professor. Um, and you said that the impeachment of my workers needs to be based on not policy differences, but it has to be, quote, has to be subversion of the Constitution, another quote from you, for illegal, in, illegal ends or serious offenses. Is that correct? Yes or no? That you said those statements. Has to be subversion of the Constitution for illegal ends or serious offenses. Yes or no? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, you're speaking rather. You've said it, I, it's on record. I need to kind of watch my time and move on through this. To, my, to, the call, to the attorney generals in the room, is not administering the laws of the land 
a serious offense illegal, for illegal ends, does it rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors? Please, each of you, please answer that question. Absolutely, Congressman. It does rise. Unequivocally, yes. We've got three attorney generals who say that the violation of these laws is a violation of the enforcement of the law and is grounds of high crimes and misdemeanors, which the Constitution clearly lays out, is high crimes and misdemeanors is a, is a reason for impeachment. What we tolerate, we empower. Congress has to do its job and send a strong signal. If you don't follow the law, you're gonna be out. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields, I now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you guys for showing up. You guys aren't exactly attorney generals of uh, southern, southern border states, are you? But even you guys are feeling the effects of what's coming across that southern border. Is that true? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Gentlemen, how long roughly did it take you to become attorney general? Go ahead, Mr. Knudsen. Well, roughly how long? I mean, campaign for the better, better part of a year. No, entire career. Just like 20 years, 15 years, how long did it? Uh, roughly 15 years. What about you, Mr. Drummond? 40. Mr. Bailey? Been practicing law for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, so you guys just didn't wake up one day and say, I want to be attorney general and snap. That happened, right? I noticed that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been trying to diminish um, you know, your, your qualifications. What's the primary responsibility of the federal government, Mr. Knudsen? Primary responsibility of the federal government is to carry out and execute the laws of the Congress. Yeah, is it to protect uh, our unalienable God-given rights as well? Absolutely. What about, does our government have a responsibility to protect its citizens, Mr. Bailey? Yes. Are any of you guys familiar with Article 4, Section 4 of our Constitution, often called the Invasion Clause? Anybody? Yes. I'm going to read it real quick. The United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion. Now, there's arguments right now about whether or not this is an invasion, but... It's tough to argue when you have the equivalent of a combat division size of illegals coming across our southern border. For those of you that don't know, that's 10,000 individuals every single day in invasion. And we've talked about what comes with those individuals from crime, you know, the economic burdens on, on our citizens, the, the, the families being destroyed of fentanyl. You guys are all familiar with that. You guys see them every single day in your own states. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Are you guys aware of the uh, job title of Alejandro Mayorkas, Mr. Knudsen? His specific job title is Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Homeland Se Secretary of Homeland Security. Now, I'm no, I'm, I'm no constitutional scholar, Mr. Drummond, but just from that job title alone, would you assess that maybe his job might be to secure and protect the homeland? He has the duty to control and guard our Oh. Mr. Bailey, is uh, Secretary Mayorkas doing that? He is, has abdicated his official legal responsibilities and his moral and ethical responsibilities to this nation. Mr. Knudsen, is he doing that? He absolutely is not. He is derelict in many of those duties. One of, one, of my colleagues on the, one of my colleagues talked about the difference between individuals crossing on the terror watch list between the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas, and the former administration. Those numbers were a stark contrast. Under the last administration, 14 individuals on the terror watch list came through, were, were encountered at that southern border. Under this administration, and we still have several months to go in this new year, already 300 individuals on the terror watch list. Are you gentlemen aware of how many individuals it took to pull off 9-11? Not 300. Yep, it was about 19. Does it concern you guys? As folks that are concerned with the security of citizens in your state, that something like that might happen in the United States of America or your state? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I want to, you guys talked about it all day long, and I find it interesting that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle kept saying that we're grandstanding here, or we're just campaigning, you know, or these are political differences, but you guys, all three of you, and we went over how long it took you to get in your positions. You guys are like the highest law enforcement uh, officials in your state, you guys all went over not just the policy differences, but the different laws that this secretary is in violation of. Mr. Nutskin, can you go over some of those really quick? I absolutely can. I think the secretary is clearly in violation of um, USC 8, section 12, 1225. Uh, he's, he's clearly violated section 1182 by granting mass parole. Uh, that, that, 
Immigration and, and Naturalization Act makes very clear that that is not to be granted on a mass basis. That's to be granted on a case-by-case, -case, yep. individual basis. Yep, thank you, sir. Mr. Ja Ms. Jackson and Mr. Bowman both said that betrayal of a nation is one of the criteria necessary for impeachment. If allowing the equivalent of an army division of illegals coming across the southern border on a daily basis, causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands due to fentanyl every single year, uh, about 100,000 every year, enabling the sex trade in this country, along with the importation of thousands of MS-13 gang members, causing the encounters of individuals on the terror watch list to go from 14 under the last administration to 300 on this, this administration, lying to Congress about having operational control, costing the American taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars for housing and care for these illegals, and more than 24,000 people from the Republic of China coming across our southern border in this last year alone. If those aren't betrayal to a nation, I don't know what is. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes or, or for his closing arguments. Thank you very much. And let me thank our witnesses for, for being here today. Uh, this hearing has confirmed what we already know uh, uh, over four hours ago. This so-called impeachment is nothing more than a thinly veiled political stunt. My Republican colleagues have failed to make a case for impeachment, failed to understand the Constitution, and failed to do anything to address challenges at the border. This hearing has been more Republican rehash. Attempting to impeach the Secretary over policy differences instead of working with Democrats on immigration and border policy reform demonstrates that Republicans are not only interested in using border security as a political talking point. This impeachment scheme is simply more distraction from a do-nothing Republican Congress. They talk about H.R. 2, a disastrous bill they wrote in secret without any opportunity for Democratic input, knowing very well that it was dead on arrival in the Senate. The so-called investigation that Chairman Green has launched has been conducted with a predetermined outcome from the start. And now our Republican colleagues are trying to pretend that this effort isn't political. Mr. Chairman, the American people will see through such an incredibly obvious sham. No matter how many times my Republican colleagues twist the facts to suit their narrative, there's absolutely no evidence that Secretary Mayorkas has committed an impeachable offense. No amount of yelling, finger pointing, off righteousness, indignation can change that fact. And we heard today from Professor Bowman, the consensus from constitutional scholars is clear. Republicans have not made a case for impeachment. Even Republicans' favorite constitutional scholar, Jonathan Turley, has come out against this impeachment, not just because it is baseless, but because it is what a dangerous precedent it would set. As Professor Turley explained, impeaching Secretary Mayorkas, quote, is a slippery slope that we would be wise to avoid. Indeed, it is precisely the temptation the framers thought that they had avoided by rejecting standards for maladministration. It's no accident that Democrats invited a legal scholar to this hearing, while Republicans invited three partisan politicians. The Republican witnesses have no expertise in impeachment. One of the witnesses is facing 41 ethics charges. Another witness, state Supreme Court unanimously found he failed to perform the plain, unequivocal, and ministerial duties of approving information for a ballot initiative. But again, no expertise on impeachment. All we learned today from the majority witnesses is that some Republican politicians don't like a Democratic cabinet secretary. Republicans are pretending to provide accountability just like they pretended to legislate these past months. In his opening, the chairman said there was no reasonable alternative to pursuing impeachment.
Let me suggest some alternatives. Republicans could have supported funding increases for border security operations instead of voting against them. Republicans could provide additional resources requested by CBP. They could engage with the administration on immigration. They have not. Republicans have failed to act at every turn. Instead of working with Democrats, they've wasted a year chasing a baseless impeachment to satisfy their most extreme right-wing members. But as what we've heard today, impeachment was never intended to be used that way. The Constitution's framers expressly did not include mismanagement, misgovernment, or maladministration as a basis for impeaching a cabinet secretary. My Republican colleagues may disagree with this administration's border policy, and that's their right. But to use impeachment to sell such differences is unconstitutional. Mr. Chairman, I understand the last year has been a tough one for Republicans and that your party would like to deflect attention elsewhere. This is very kind of thing that the framers work to avoid when establishing grounds for impeachment. Three years ago, Mr. Chairman, you wrote, unity can be only achieved by focusing on where we find common ground instead of drawing new battle lines, and that every one of us has a role in bridging the divide. When Chairman Green is ready to listen to his own words, I want to be clear, Democrats will be here waiting to work on responsible and effective policies to strengthen our border security using the levels of power that the Constitution actually gives Congress. But until then, we'll continue calling this sham impeachment for what it is, a political stunt. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, Yields, I, before I start my uh, closing statement, I just want to make an observation. It's, it's very interesting that we point out that Mr. Uh, uh, Bishop can't talk pol political stuff about running for election, but all the testimony from the left have been about politics, about running for office, and about... So it, just find it fascinating. But anyway, um, I recognize myself for my closing statement. Today we've heard powerful testimonies from the attorneys general of three states who are dealing with the consequences of Secretary Mayorkas' border crisis. I want to thank you all for being here and for your testimony, and of course, I'll thank Mr. Bowman for being here as well. As our witnesses made it abundantly clear, every state is now a border state. And why are we here? We're here because Secretary Mayorkas' policies were exploited by the drug cartels and have done incredible damage to the United States. Those policies were in violation of the laws passed by this Congress. The Congress said... The INA detain, parole's an exception based on extreme circumstances, not 85%, as the secretary says, is now just being released into the country willy-nilly. It's a violation of law. And interestingly enough, so he's disregarded the Congress. He's also disregarded the judiciary branch. Four court rulings said cease and desist because you're breaking the law. I'm sorry, I took the oath at age 17 to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The oath wasn't to the American people. It wasn't to defend the, the landmass or the flag. It was to defend the Constitution. This secretary took the same oath to defend the Constitution. Well, I'm sorry, but I think the Constitution of the United States says we write the laws and not him get to pick and choose whatever the heck he wants to when he as the executive branch gets to ex execute the laws. He is to execute the laws as written. That is the Constitution he took an oath to. Four court orders cease and desist because you're breaking the law, and he disregards the judiciary branch and continues his policy. In fact, he doubles down, creating more policies that do even more catch and release, which is why I think it's intentional. He's abusing his position to force his woke immigration policies on the United States of America, despite the fact that Congress is supposed to fix those immigration laws. On top of that, 
Back on script now. On top of that, Secretary Mayorkas knows full well the consequences of these policies, but instead, he's rever of reversing course, he's doubling down. It's worse. He's been to the border. He's seen the numbers. He's seen the fentanyl seizures. He's met with the grieving families. He knows about the cartels. He knows about the human trafficking and the child exploitation, yet he doesn't change a thing. In fact, as I said, he admitted to the Border Patrol the other day in a closed meeting, 85% are being released. Despite the intentionality behind this open border, Secretary Mayorkas is attempting to skirt the consequences of act his actions. He has continuously tried to deflect blaming climate change, wars in Latin America, non-existent DHS budget cuts. Well, there have been no budget cuts. And what is the cost of Secretary Mayorkas' border crisis? Fentanyl poisoning is killing thousands of young people every year. We learned from Attorney General Bailey that a total of 43 Missouri children died from unintentional, unintentional, accidental. They didn't have a choice. We had a testimony over here if Americans would just stop using drugs. Those little babies didn't have a choice. That baby on a VRBO in Florida certainly didn't have a choice. She wasn't able to just say no. My heart breaks for this baby and her parents. Because of this border crisis, thousands of mothers won't get to see their kids graduate. Thousands of fathers won't be able to walk their daughters down the aisle at those weddings. As a parent myself, that breaks my heart. That's the human cost. And apparently I need to explain to my colleagues, while it is accurate that most of the fentanyl is seized at the CBP, uh, you know, intercepted at the official points of entry, this is because those facilities are equipped for that purpose. Yet, we also know that drugs are coming across between ports of entry. It simply isn't being caught. This is because Border Patrol agents are tied up processing people at the crossing sites and it's not like we can put the entire border as an x-ray machine or a CT scanner. And while my Democrat colleagues may not believe me, I hope that they will believe those on the front lines. Border Patrol agents have told us that drugs coming between the ports of entry is a key driver of the rising fentanyl crisis. Why else has fentanyl gone on the street from 98 bucks a hit to 25 bucks a hit after this uh, secretary came into office? It's because of the simple supply and demand of coming across the southern border. We've also heard that federal officials, from federal officials, that they, all, they, they believe they only apprehend roughly 5 to 10% of the fentanyl coming in. That, that's from the border. They're only catching 5 to 10%. What really matters here isn't how much fentanyl is caught, but how much fentanyl is flooding the neighborhoods. We got three guys here from three states just discredited by the ranking member, but they're here to testify what's happening in their states. And you know what? Some of us heard you. Some of us heard you. People are dying because of this. Because of Secretary Mayorkas' border crisis, cities and states nationwide struggle to pay first responders while health care and education systems falter. In fact, medical care for undocumented aliens will cost $7 billion this year. We also heard from Attorney General Drummond about the organized criminal operations and that some illegal aliens run once they arrive. He shared that in Oklahoma alone, the AG office prosecuted 50 complex, multi-jurisdictional criminal cases, most of them involving Mexican and Chinese drug cartels coming across the southern border. Make no mistake, these human trafficking and drug trafficking rings are sophisticated and they've taken a foothold in the United States because of our open border. Finally, we can't negate the credible threat this open border poses to our national security. With emboldened Islamic terrorist groups and an increasingly aggressive Communist Chinese party, we have to wonder how many bad actors are in that 1.8 million known gotaways and how many are in the unknown gotaways. Well, we won't know until something tragic happens. When we embarked on this investigation almost a year ago, we knew there would be roadblocks and that it would be a formidable challenge. No matter how hard this process gets, Homeland Republicans will not back down. The American people deserve answers, accountability, and ultimately an end to the border crisis. Look, if you have a secretary, a cabinet secretary, who breaks the laws or refuses to obey the laws of Congress, refuses to 
adhere to the rulings of a judiciary, the cease and desist orders from a judge, I mean, that's lawlessness on his own part. If it were me, a Republican, I'd expect to be impeached. You can't have cabinet secretaries that just decide to do whatever the heck they want to do. The Committee on Homeland Security has made every effort to ensure that this investigation was thorough. We do not take this lightly. The Homeland Security Committee spent a, almost a year, countless hours. We held 10 hearings. We heard from two dozen witnesses, released five reports totaling 300 pages. We conducted numerous transcribed interviews, border chiefs, multiple visits to the border to see for ourselves. I don't hold any personal animosity towards Secretary Mayorkas, but I sure as hell don't wanna see him continue as Secretary of Homeland Security, not after the pain and turmoil and chaos his policies have inflicted on the American people. And when congressional oversight demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that executive branches are neglecting their duty, overstepping their authority, ignoring laws passed by Congress, it is our duty to act to defend this institution, to defend the Constitution. Also, just to be clear, this is the responsibility of Congress. The Supreme Court made it clear in United States versus Texas, according to the court, and I quote, even though the federal courts lack Article III jurisdiction over the suit, other forums remain open for examining the executive branch's arrest policies. For example, Congress poses an array of tools to analyze and influence these policies. Those are political checks for a political process, end quote. So no, so not only do these proceedings have the support of the House, the Supreme Court has pointed to impeachment as a source of relief for states suffering a border crisis put together, orchestrated by a secretary who is violating the laws passed by Congress and disregarding the court's orders. Now, before I end, I'd like to address a few things that other things my Democrat colleagues have said. Let me start with saying, I'm very disappointed in the ranking member for misquoting me. He claimed that I wrote that I will not support another dime to DHS. This is inaccurate. What I wrote was I will not support another dime to DHS until the policies of HR 2 are signed into law and enforced by the administration. And we're talking about the supplemental. So we're not talking about the budget, which has already gone through and passed the House. We're talking about additional dollars in a supplemental. So to suggest that I would defund the Department of Homeland Security is disingenuous at best. I can tell you there have been a lot of Democrats who've said defund ICE and defund the police. I never said defund Homeland Security. And <clears throat> I'd also like to address the claim that Secretary Mayorkas isn't at fault here, that he isn't to blame for the economic crisis in Latin America. I agree. But poverty in Latin America is nothing too new. And actually, poverty rates in Latin America have stayed flat from last administration to this one. Further, I'd like to reiterate the Democrats sent these articles to impeachment to our committee in November. They sent it to this committee. The Homeland Security Committee has the authority of the House to conduct these impeachment proceedings, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Democrats can bring up a New York Times popcorn story all they want to. They keep talking about MAGA Republicans and former President Trump this and that. But it's clear these are deflections because they have no answers for the piss poor performance of Secretary Mayorkas and his policies. And let me just point out, my Democrat colleagues are quick to talk about kids in cages under Trump, but did a single one of them mission the 85,000 missing UACs under President Biden? Of course not. The hypocrisy in this room is palpable. And of course our guide should always be the intent of the framers of our Constitution, the Founding Fathers, regarding how Constitution was intended to be understood. But too often in political debates, people can fall into inconsistency for possibly partisan reasons. I get that. For example, Professor Bowman wrote a book on impeachment in 2019 called High Crimes and Misdemeanors, A History of Impeachment for the Age of Trump. In it, he states the power of the House to impeach cabinet secretary, secretaries, quote, remains important as a signal of legislative displeasure 
with administrative personnel and policy, end quote. Yet today, he's testified on multiple occasions that policy alone isn't enough for an impeachment. That's what Professor Bowman wrote when Donald Trump was president, but now, in his written testimony at page three, he writes that impeachment, and I quote, should not be attempted based on simple policy disagreements between Congress and the executive branch, end quote. I guess that was then and this is now. But let me be clear, no one is supporting impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas over policy differences. The impeachable offenses relate to violations of the law. Insisting on enforcing the law as written by Congress is not a policy difference. It is a fundamental requirement of the Constitution. Lastly, I gotta tell you, I was appalled from someone on the left who said, suggested this has all been a waste of time. We're here today because it is our duty to provide oversight and hold the executive branch accountable. And yes, this includes the option to impeach. We cannot allow a cabinet secretary to violate, to violate the laws, disregard the constitutional structure, lie to Congress under oath, all to massive harm to the Americans and do nothing about it. And if a Republican were head of DHS and committing these same acts, I can assure you we wouldn't tolerate it from them either. It is the Homeland Security Committee's responsibility to provide oversight of DHS. This is what we were elected to do. This is what we were appointed to this committee for. Now, this might not be how you want to spend your time, but it certainly is how we must be spending our time. And I ask the members here today in fighting to stop the needless death of children, the fentanyl poisoning, a waste of time. Is it a waste of time to try to protect those kids? Trying to stop criminal cartels from wreaking havoc on the country, a waste of time? It's not. And the insinuation is appalling. What has been a waste of time, the amount of taxpayer, what has been a waste, the amount of taxpayer dollars this border crisis has cost, the amount of people who have died as a result of fentanyl flowing across our southern border, the amount of migrants who've lost their lives making the dangerous journey, the amount of money state and local governments have had to spend cleaning up Secretary Mayorkas's mess. This is where the real waste has been, not these official proceedings. As we continue these proceedings in the coming days, it's important that the American people remember the facts and that this body once again embraces our constitutional responsibilities. When I took that oath as a young boy on the plane at West Point, it meant something to me then. And when I took it when the people of Tennessee sent me up here, it meant just as much, if not more. We will support the basic tenets of that document and that is Congress writes the laws, the president executes those laws, the judiciary interprets those laws, and they have a responsibility to do their duty, and we do also. Without objection, that ends my closing statement, and without objection, the committee stands adjourned.